Welcome and thank you for joining us today for Know Your Nets, the Net Research Foundation's 2022 Virtual Patient and Family Education Conference. I'm Elise Gellerman, CEO of NetRF and a co-chair of today's conference. Our full day of net education is based on what you told us you wanted to learn about. Thank you to the more than 500 people who responded to our conference survey earlier this year. This program would not be possible without our co-sponsor, University of Chicago Medicine, as well as Advanced Accelerator Applications, Ipsen, Tercera, Progenix, ITM, Crinetics, and HutchMed. For those of you who have been diagnosed with neuroendocrine cancer, it was surely a shock. Maybe you had never heard of NETS. You may not have known where to turn for information or support. Whether that happened two weeks ago or 20 years ago, education is so important for you and your family. When you know your nets, you can better advocate for yourself. And today's a great example of how you are not alone. The net community is strong and supportive. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my co-chair for Know Your Nets, Dr. Xavier Koitkin of University of Chicago Medicine. He's a surgical oncologist with expertise in treating neuroendocrine, thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal tumors. He is the director of the University of Chicago Neuroendocrine Tumor Program and works with a multidisciplinary team that specializes in nets. I want to thank him for his collaboration and his wonderful work on this conference. Dr. Koitkin? Good morning, I'm Dr. Xavier Koitkin from the University of Chicago. Welcome to our NetRF 2022 virtual um, educational conference. Uh, we are very excited uh, that you're here. Thank you for joining us. I believe that this is the conference where we've had the most uh, registration, so this is really exciting. We have a, a great team that is assembled for you today of uh, panelists and physicians that will talk to you about all kinds of subjects related to neuroendocrine tumor research. We'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, including the University of Chicago Medicine, and I hope that you will enjoy this program. Thank you and see you soon. We start today's conference with someone who, like NetRF, hails from Boston. Dr. Jennifer Chan is the clinical director of the Gastrointestinal Cancer Center at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where she directs the center's program in carcinoid and neuroendocrine tumors and is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Chan discusses new treatments and trials in targeted therapies and chemotherapy. Mm. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jennifer Chan. I'm a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I'd like to thank NetRF for the invitation to join you this morning to talk about new treatments and clinical trials. I'll be focusing on targeted therapies and chemotherapies. I wanna start first by noting that there have been a number of advances in recent years in uh, our understanding of neuroendocrine tumors as well as treatment. And there is a lot of work that is ongoing now to build on this progress. And much of the work is on clinical trials, which I'll provide an overview of today. I wanna start with a few basic words about clinical trials and what they are and why they're important. So clinical trials are research studies that evaluate how well a treatment works in people. There are a number of different things that are being investigated, including optimal dosing of therapy, side effects, effectiveness of treatment, and then also how these treatments may compare to others that are available. Well-designed clinical trials are very important for us and also really the only way that we can continue to make advances in treatment and outcomes. So I wanna thank everybody for their interest in this topic and also for participation. There are several phases of clinical trials and they all vary in their aims as well as the number of participants. Phase one trials are trials that are relatively small that focus on safety and proper dosing of a therapy. Phase two trials build on this work with the dose that is established and focus on effectiveness and also characterization of side effects at that particular dose. Typically, these trials contain a few more participants than what we see in phase one trials. 
phase three trials are even larger that more rigorously evaluate efficacy and can also involve comparisons to other existing therapies. Some of the larger phase three trials can include hundreds of participants. Once a treatment is available, continued work is done to better characterize not just efficacy, but also long-term side effects. And these types of studies can involve even thousands of participants. There are other elements of clinical trials that are also evaluated, including quality of life, patient reported outcomes. Some clinical trials also build in biomarker studies that help us to better understand predictors of efficacy. And then some trials, particularly phase one trials, also involve pharmacokinetic studies that can ex examine drug absorption, metabolism, and excretion. A lot of people ask, is there a clinical trial that's for me and when should I consider a clinical trial? I think it is always appropriate to ask your clinical team if a trial is a good option for you. I think trials are particularly relevant at the time of a new diagnosis when initial therapy is being considered because a current therapy is either not working well or not tolerated well. So with that information in mind, I want to spend uh, the next few minutes talking about clinical trials in well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. I'm going to start with this um, basic overview that lists some of the therapies that are commonly used to treat well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, um, which includes somatostatin analogs, and then also PRRT, everolimus, sunitinib, or captem. The options will depend based on where the primary tumor is. But these are all treatments that have been established to be effective in other clinical trials and are approved or commonly used. Some of the unanswered questions that are being investigated in some of the ongoing or recently completed clinical trials include, how can we optimize treatment with somatostatin analogs? How should some of these treatments be sequenced? Are there biomarkers that can predict efficacy and help with treatment selection? And can we expand treatment options for patients and add to this list of therapies? I'll start first with somatostatin analogs, which include octreotide and lanreotide, are commonly used as first-line treatment for advanced neuroendocrine tumors that are not able to be resected and where a local treatment like liver embolization is not being utilized. Somatostatin analogs can slow disease progression and they also can improve symptoms of carcinoid syndrome or other hormone sy syndromes that are related to hormone secretion. Much of the work done to establish the efficacy of somatostatin analogs was performed in GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. A clinical trial that was recently reported was the SPINET trial. This was a phase three trial that evaluated lanreotide in lung neuroendocrine tumors. This study was unfortunately terminated early due to low enrollment, but the results of the trial were evaluated. Again, this was a phase three trial that evaluated lanreotide compared to placebo in patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors, both typical and atypical carcinoid tumors that were somatostatin receptor positive. The results of this trial suggested that there is also a role for lanreotide, not just in GI and lung, GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but also in lung neuroendocrine tumors, particularly typical carcinoid tumors. Another trial evaluating somatostatin analogs that was recently presented was the Clarinet 4 trial. This was a phase two trial that was examining whether giving more frequent lanreotide could help in patients whose disease had progressed on standard doses of lanreotide, 120 milligrams every four weeks. Patients who were included in this particular trial had pancreatic and mid-gut or GI neuroendocrine tumors whose disease had grown on standard dose lanreotide every four weeks. They all received lanreotide every two weeks, and the primary endpoint of the study was to look at progression-free survival, so essentially the time from starting treatment until the cancer had grown a certain amount. The results of the trial showed encouraging progression-free survival results. So this trial, although not definitive, suggests that there may be a benefit for more frequent dosing of lanreotide in patients whose disease has progressed on standard doses of treatment. Another new clinical trial um, is also looking at a somatostatin analog. This is the Sorrento trial, and it is examining the efficacy of CAM 2029. This is a novel, high exposure, subcutaneous formulation of octreotide that can be self-administered by patients. This is a phase three trial that is evaluating CAM 2029 in comparison to what we standardly use, which is octreotide LAR, 30 milligrams every four weeks, 
or lanreotide, 120 milligrams every four weeks. This is designed to be a, what we call a frontline clinical trial. Patients cannot have had any more than six months of a prior somatostatin analog therapy or have had any other prior therapy where their cancer grew. The primary endpoint is to look at progression-free survival and to test the efficacy of CAM 2029 compared to octreotide and lanreotide. At the time of disease progression, there is an optional extension where patients can also receive CAM 2029 given at a more frequent dosing of every one week. So this, again, is a newly activated trial looking at a novel formulation of octreotide, which has the advantages of being self-administered to give uh, patients some control over treatment. I'm going to move on to some of the other questions that are being evaluated in trials. One is related to sequencing of treatment, and others are how do we predict or are there biomarkers that can predict efficacy and help with selection. Some of the trials that are comparing available therapies, the COMPETE trial is an international phase three trial that is evaluating the efficacy of PRRT with lutetium-177 etotriotide compared with everolimus in patients with advanced grade one to two gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So the results of this study will help us to determine whether PRRT is more effective than everolimus or vice versa. This trial has completed enrollment and we're awaiting the results. Another trial that is um, comparing available therapies is a newly activated trial. This is um, the Alliance A022001 trial. This is a randomized phase three trial of PRRT with lutetium-177 dotatate compared to capecitabine and temozolomide in well-differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And again, the results of this trial will be able to help us understand the comparative efficacy of these two types of treatment and also give us some prospective evaluation of the efficacy of PRRT for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Another trial that is also comparing PRRT to other therapy is the NETR2 trial. And this is a trial that is evaluating PRRT with lutetium-177 dotatate compared to high-dose octreotide LAR in patients who have GI or pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that are more aggressive, uh, grade two to grade three neuroendocrine tumors. And this is a group of patients who may benefit from earlier initiation of PRRT. So the results of uh, the trial will hopefully help us to answer this question. The COMPOSE trial is another international phase three trial that is also evaluating the efficacy of PRRT compared to other agents. This, just like the NETR2 trial, is evaluating patients with more aggressive grade two to grade three um, well-differentiated gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. It is comparing lutetium-177 etotriotide PRT compared to chemotherapy, which could be either capecitabine temozolomide Fox or Everolimus. I do want to spend um, some time talking about this next trial, Alliance A021901. This is a randomized phase two trial that is evaluating PRT with lutetium-177 dotatate compared to Everolimus in patients with somatostatin receptor bronchial neuroendocrine tumors. Much of the data that we have regarding the efficacy of PRT is in patients with gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So this particular trial will give us prospective evidence of the efficacy of PRT in patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors, and then also how it compares to Everolimus. In this particular trial, patients who are receiving Everolimus will be allowed to cross over to receive PRT with lutetium-177 dotatate at the time that progression occurs. I'm going to next focus on a topic of whether we can expand treatment options for patients and add to the list of active therapies. A focus of clinical trial investigation relates to targeted therapies in neuroendocrine tumors. This particular slide shows a cartoon of a neuroendocrine cancer cell and the receptors that are on the surface of the cell, as well as some of the signaling pathways that are within the cells that can signal and drive growth. Some of the important signaling pathways in neuroendocrine tumors are the mTOR signaling pathway, which I've highlighted at the bottom, which is the target of Everolimus. 
Tyrosine kinase inhibitors are a class of medicines that can bind to and inhibit a number of different receptors, but importantly, the VEGF receptor, which is one of the uh, receptors that is important for signaling and driving angiogenesis, which is the growth of new blood vessels that can support the growth and spread of cancer. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, are used to, to treat neuroendocrine tumors now. The only TKI that is approved in the United States for treatment of NET is sunitinib, which is approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. There have been a number of tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have been evaluated in neuroendocrine tumors, including the ones I've listed on this slide, exitinib, cabozantinib, limbatinib, pezopinib, surafatinib. All of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors have shown activity, although it's still uncertain where they will fit into the treatment pathway and also whether one is superior to another. Surafatinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that inhibits several receptors, including VEGF receptor, FGF receptor 1, another receptor that's called CSF receptor 1. And this is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that was studied in two phase three trials conducted in China that led to the approval of surafatinib in China. Both of these trials, the SANET-P trial, which evaluated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and the SANET-EP trial that evaluated surafatinib in neuroendocrine tumors starting outside the pancreas showed encouraging progression-free survival results and also an improvement in progression-free survival compared with placebo. These results led to the approval in China, but I think it's important to note that about a third of the patients who were treated on these clinical trials had had no prior treatment. And in that SANET EP trial, there were very few small intestine neuroendocrine tumors and mostly non-functional neuroendocrine tumors associated with no hormone secretion. And this is different from the typical extra pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that we typically see in the United States. Although surafatinib is approved in Asia, this is not approved by the FDA for use in the United States. Earlier this year, the FDA had announced that uh, it was going to await results of future clinical trials that looked at surafatinib in a population that was similar to what we see in the United States. Cabozantinib is another tyrosine kinase inhibitor that targets receptors including VEGF receptor, Axel, MET, and RET. This is a TKI that is being studied in the Alliance A021602 trial, also known as the Cabinet trial. This is a trial that is evaluating cabozantinib versus placebo in patients with well to moderately differentiated neuroendocrine tumors starting in either the pancreas or extrapancreatic sites, including the lung, GI tract or unknown sites. Patients who are enrolling on the trial will have received prior therapy, at least one prior FDA-approved therapy with cancer that has grown within the 12 months prior to entering the trial. There is a randomization, a two-to-one chance of receiving cabozantinib or placebo. For patients who receive placebo, there is an ability to cross over and receive cabozantinib at the time of disease progression. One other agent that has newly been approved by the FDA in the US is belzutifan. This is another targeted agent. This is an oral inhibitor of hypoxia-inducible factor, HIF-2-alpha, which is involved in oxygen sensing. This was um, approved by the FDA based on the results of a phase two trial looking at the activity of belzutifan in patients with von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. This is a genetic condition that is uh, notable for mutations in the VHL gene that lead to abnormal oxygen sensing and formation of tumors like renal cell cancer, kidney cancer, and also pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Some of the patients in this trial also had not just kidney cancer, but pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors had reduction in size of their tumors when treated with belzutifan. So this was approved towards the end of last year for VHL-associated cancers that were not needing immediate surgery. There is an ongoing trial that is looking at belzutifan in patients with pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, as well as G1 and G2 pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, because some of the signaling pathways may also be active in non-VHL-related neuroendocrine tumors as well. 
One other trial that I want to point out is the SWOG2014 trial. This is a randomized phase two trial that is looking at postoperative chemotherapy in patients who have undergone surgery for well-differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors where there is a high risk for recurrence after surgery that is defined by what we call the Zadie score of three or more that takes into account grade, that takes into account size of tumor, Patients who have up to five liver metastases that are removed um, at the time of surgery for their pancreas uh, neuroendocrine tumor are also eligible. There was a randomization to chemotherapy with four cycles of capecitabine and temozolomide, or what we usually do um, in clinical practice, um, which is the standard, which is observation. So the results of this trial will help us to understand whether there is a benefit to receiving chemotherapy with capecitabine and temozolomide in patients where there may be a high risk of recurrence after surgery. I'm going to end with a few minutes about clinical trials uh, for poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. The management of poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas primarily relies on chemotherapy, often with platinum-based chemotherapy, carboplatin or cisplatin with etoposide. A subset of patients with poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas may be candidates for immunotherapy if there is a high mutational burden or if there is high microsatellite instability. One of the areas of clinical trial investigation recently has been whether there are alternatives to chemotherapy with platinum and etoposide, and also trying to better understand what the role of immunotherapy is. Trials that have investigated alternatives to platinum and etoposide recently have been a randomized trial that was conducted in Japan. This was the JCOG1213 trial that looked at chemotherapy with cisplatin and etoposide compared to cisplatin and arenotecan. The results of the trial, which were presented at the, at the early part of this year, showed that cisplatin and etoposide was not superior to cisplatin and etoposide. So for many people, cisplatin and etoposide remains a standard of care. There also is a ongoing trial that's being conducted in France that is looking at first-line chemotherapy with platinum and etoposide compared to a regimen that's called full fox Erie. Recently, this year, the results of ECOG 2142 were reported, and this was a randomized phase two trial that looked at platinum with etoposide compared with capecitabine and temozolomide in an advanced grade three neuroendocrine neoplasms. The results of this trial demonstrated that chemotherapy with capecitabine and temozolomide is not superior to platinum and etoposide. There is more toxicity with platinum and etoposide. I will point out that it will be helpful to review some of the subset analyses to look at the activity of these chemotherapy regimens in well-differentiated grade three neuroendocrine tumors compared with poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas because these are very distinct disease entities. And um, it will be interesting to note whether one chemotherapy regimen might work well in one type of disease versus the other. For uh, future clinical trials, I think we are also aiming to look at well-differentiated grade three neuroendocrine tumors separately from poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. I wanna add with a few words about immunotherapy in combination with chemotherapy. For small cell lung carcinoma, which is a form of poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma that starts in the lung, there have been trials that have shown that adding chemotherapy to platinum with etoposide in the first line setting can improve survival. So it is pretty standard to use chemotherapy and immunotherapy together for small cell lung carcinoma. We don't yet know for poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas that start outside the lung whether these results will hold true. So there is a recently activated trial, the SWOG212 trial, that is looking at adding immunotherapy, in this case atezolizumab, which is a PDL1 inhibitor, to chemotherapy with platinum and etoposide for extrapulmonary poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, looking at it both in combination with immunotherapy and then as a maintenance strategy after the chemotherapy is done. So that was a bit of a whirlwind um, of all of the ongoing clinical trials in neuroendocrine cancers. I just wanna end with a few words that these trials are really important for making advances in the treatment of NET. There are, as um, I've reviewed with you, multiple trials that are being conducted to help us evaluate new treatments, and then also help us to understand how to best utilize the treatments that we currently have available. 
whether one should be used before the other or one is better than another. We definitely value participation in clinical trials, and I would encourage you to ask your NET team if a tr clinical trial is a good option for you. So I want to end with a word of thanks for your attention today and also for your contributions to both NET research and clinical trials. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Next up from the West Coast is Dr. Courtney Lawn Heath. Dr. Heath is an assistant professor of molecular imaging and therapeutics in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at the University of California, San Francisco. She is going to update us on new treatments and trials in radioligand therapy and PRRT. Mm. Hi everyone, I'm Courtney Lawn Heath. I'm a radiologist and nuclear medicine physician at UCSF. So we do a lot of radiopharmaceutical therapy, including PRRT at UCSF, and I'm very excited about what the future holds in this space. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. I have no disclosures. Now, first I wanna make sure that we're all kind of up to date on the current state of PRRT. Where are we now in clinical practice? Before then going on to discuss all the sort of exciting future developments that are happening. So just to bring us all up to speed, now we probably all know that well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor cells have a lot of these somatostatin receptors on their surface, right? And of course, we take advantage of this in first-line therapy for this disease using somatostatin analogs like octreotide. And these things like octreotide bind to the somatostatin receptor. This triggers a whole bunch of different events that sort of inhibit growth of the tumor cell. Uh, but one other thing that happens is that binding of this SSA to the receptor actually causes that cell to internalize the whole complex, to sort of eat the complex. And so that over time, you actually get this accumulation of SSA inside the tumor cell. Now that's something we can take advantage of with PRRT. I call it the Trojan horse strategy, where we use radioactive octreotide instead of plain octreotide which to the unsuspecting you know, tumor cell looks just like regular octreotide, so it binds to the receptor in the same way, and the unsuspecting cell internalizes it in the same way. The only difference being, of course, it's radioactive, right? And so as more and more build up inside the tumor cell, the damage being done in the tumor cell starts to build up, including free radicals and that leads to DNA damage and uh, hopefully eventually tumor cell death. Now the molecule that we use for PRRT currently, the actual molecule has a few different like puzzle pieces that compose it. And each of these pieces can be sort of swapped out and tweaked. And that's what we're gonna hear about for the future directions section. But as far as what we use now, the combination of puzzle pieces, we have a somatostatin analog, uh, and that's actually the part that's called Tate. We have DOTA, which is something called a chelator, uh, but the way I like to think of it is basically to me, this structure looks kind of like a bird's nest. And then the last puzzle piece is the egg inside the bird's nest, which is the little radioactive atom, in this case, lutetium-177. Now, this sort of assembly of puzzle pieces here, lutetium dotatate, is that compound that we currently use for PRRT most commonly. It was FDA approved in 2018. And it was largely on the basis of this landmark 2016 Netter 1 trial, which you may have heard about, which essentially pitted regular SSA against PRRT and found that PRRT patients overall had a 79% lower risk of disease progression or death compared to the regular SSA group. Also, PRRT improved several really important quality of life factors like physical functioning and the frequency of diarrhea. Well, so that study started in 2016, they updated it in 2018, but they've continued to follow the patients a number of years out. So actually last year, the final overall survival analysis came out. And because this was a big, important trial, everybody in the field was waiting really anxiously for that result. So I wanted to update you on it too. It showed that the median overall survival of the PRRT group was four years compared to three years for the control group. But when they ran a statistical analysis, they found out actually this difference didn't turn out to be statistically significant. Uh, but it does turn out there was a really big confounder that messed up the data a lot here. And that is that 36% of patients, over a third of patients in the control arm 
that weren't supposed to get PRRT actually did end up getting PRRT after all when they progressed, but they were still counted as being in the control group. So th this definitely, you know, underestimated the efficacy of PRRT as a result. So that's a limitation. So for now, Lutetia and Dotatate definitely remains the champion in the PRRT space, but there are some challengers and some stiff competition. And alpha PRRT is going to be one of those, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But so now that we're on the same page kind of about PRRT currently, let's talk about a few ways that we can make it better. And perhaps the most obvious way is to take our what we already have, our current PRRT agent, and just simply try to improve it in a couple of different ways. You know, we're starting to use PRRT in settings that we wouldn't have used it in before. So just expanding the use of it. For instance, surgically resectable disease. Now, it didn't used to be that you would say the words surgery and PRRT in the same breath, uh, but now it's actually starting to be used in the pre-surgical setting to potentially shrink tumors enough to turn them from unresectable to resectable. So people, patients who couldn't get surgery might be able to get surgery. It was 26% of the patients in this study that saw that happen. So it was the minority, but still worth a shot. PRT is also being looked at in higher grade disease. That landmark Netter 1 trial limited patients to only a grade 1 or grade 2 net and a KI-67 of under 20%. But there are a couple of more recent studies that are actually including grade threes that are getting PRRT and also KI-67s up to 55%, so expanding uh, the usefulness potentially here. And lastly, the use is expanding outside of gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And frankly, starting to really get used in just about any disease, you name it, if it's avid, if it's hot on dotatate PET, uh, then it's potentially able to be treated with PRRT. And that includes this rare malignant paraganglioma disease where PRRT has been found to achieve disease control in about two thirds of patients. Uh, and in bronchial neuroendocrine, which is in the lungs, and that's, uh, there's actually an open and ongoing multicenter clinical trial in that space right now. Now, another change we can make to our existing therapy is we can use something called dosimetry. If you haven't heard of this term, dosimetry, uh, you, this probably won't be the last you'll hear of it. I'm gonna explain what it is in just a second, but just to kind of contextualize why I'm talking about it, let's just recall currently how PRRT works, right? How it's dosed. Currently, all patients get the same administered activity, no matter how much they weigh, how hot their disease is on dotatate PET, how fast they metabolize it, whether they have a lot of disease or a little disease, whether it looks like this or this or this or this. And unlike with chemo, PRRT, we can actually trace exactly. We don't have to just administer it and, and cross our fingers. We can trace exactly where and how much radiopharmaceutical went where in the body in each person. And we can measure the resulting radiation dose that was delivered to each tumor and to organs that are at risk, like maybe the kidneys. And this act of measuring radiation dose, that's what we call dosimetry. And it turns out that radiation dose that's delivered to tumors and to background organs like kidneys varies hugely from one patient to the next. And it's not actually something that's predictable by other factors. You can't just look at a person or look at their blood work or anything and, and, and determine ahead of time uh, what the dose is gonna be like. You need imaging uh, to, to do this dosimetry. And so anyway, this indicated to us, there's probably room for greater personalization than just sort of this one size fits all, same dose for everyone kind of approach. So here's an example of a study called personalized PRRT or PPRRT, where 36 patients got personalized PRRT based on results of dosimetry. But they actually then did a simulation where they back calculated, well, what would the doses, the radiation doses to the tumors and stuff, how much radiation would they have gotten if we had just done this like one size fits all regular approach. And what they found was that patients tumors using the personalized dosimetry approach received almost 1.5 times higher radiation doses compared to when personalized dosimetry was not used. So this shows we're probably actually currently underdosing a lot of patients. And who knows, we may even be overdosing some other patients because we're just not measuring it. So instead of that, in the future, we want to use post-treatment imaging to make sure that we're delivering the right amount of radiation to suit each different person's disease and each different person's unique kind of metabolism and everything. In other words, we actually image the PRRT that was given to a patient. You can actually image it after the fact. 
and calculate how much dose went where in the body. And we would then use this information to determine either how much activity a patient should get next time or how many total cycles uh, you should do until they're optimally treated. And in fact, this was tried in Europe in a study of 200 patients who just, they just kept giving them fixed cycles of PRT over and over again with dosimetry though, so they knew when to stop, until they maxed out what, what they thought to be a safe radiation dose to their kidneys. It turns out some patients actually could only safely receive three cycles of PRRT, but some patients were able to safely get as many as nine cycles of PRRT, which of course is way beyond the four that we typically allow. And again, there was no other way that this was predictable based on anything else other than just using dosimetry. Ultimately though, we need randomized trials in order to confirm this and to determine whether this has any actual impact on uh, important things like survival. Now, the next thing we can do with, again, our existing PRRT molecules, we can try to improve kind of where it goes and how long it kind of sticks around in the body. So one way is called intra-arterial PRRT. And so in some context here is that, so for patients like this patient has a bunch of tumors in the liver. For patients like this, where it's mostly in the liver and no, nowhere else, it seems almost like overkill, frankly, to give PRRT, right? Because that, that exposes the whole body to radiation when really almost all the disease is just in one organ, right? So if we were able to just give PRRT to the liver instead of the whole body, you know, would it treat those liver tumors better and would there be less uh, toxicity to the rest of the body? So we tried this at UCSF actually with 10 people, a pilot study. We told our interventional radiology colleagues, hey, stop doing embolizations for just a second. And can you instead try giving PRRT into that main blood vessel that directly feeds the liver? In other words, intra-arterial and in patients with a lot of liver disease compared to IV, which is where we give it to the whole body, the intraarterial administration resulted in a lot more uptake in the tumors, as you can see from on the right, the sort of darker appearance of those tumors. Um, but strangely, this didn't actually hold up in every single patient, especially patients with less disease in the liver. In fact, this patient, we actually saw the opposite. The tumors didn't light up as much. Now we have some possible sort of explanations maybe as to why this happened. And we have some ideas for maybe a way to regroup and, and try again going forward. But for now, uh, we're sticking with the IV whole body route uh, for that reason. Now, another thing people have tried to do is to take that PRRT dotatate molecule and modify it so it doesn't get flushed out of the body so fast. You know, the kidneys flush out any of that radiation that doesn't go to the tumors uh, into the urine. It makes really expensive urine. And the rationale here of making it stick around longer in the bloodstream is, well, hey, if it's sticking around longer, maybe there's more around that will go to the tumors instead of just going out into making that expensive urine. So to do this, they took the regular dotatate molecule. This is that same kind of puzzle piece molecule that I showed you before, and they literally just stuck another big old puzzle piece on it called Evans Blue, which just happens to bind to a substance in the bloodstream called albumin. The specific details don't matter, but the bottom line is that this modification made it so that it didn't get taken out of the bloodstream by the kidneys so fast. It stuck around a lot longer than regular PRRT. So these are images of someone who got regular PRRT. So like I said, we can image this, right? So this is an image of the PRRT itself in the patient after they got it. The left image is three hours after getting PRRT and the right image is uh, three days after getting PRRT. And you can see how much fainter the uptake looks on day three, right? And that's because regular PRRT, the kidneys are flushing it out full time. And so it's, it's leaving the bloodstream quickly. In contrast, using this modified molecule, this patient on the right there, they didn't wait three days, they waited seven days before re-imaging, and you can see the tumors look just as bright as they did on day one. And so this confirmed the idea that, hey, if PRRT sticks around longer in the bloodstream, more of it will go to the tumors and maybe treat them for longer. But, and there's always a but, isn't there, with these, yeah, <laughs> the radiation dose to the kidneys because of this was over three times higher unfortunately, than with regular PRRT. And most importantly, the dose to the bone marrow, which is what makes all your blood cells and is really important, was over 18 times higher. So this was a sort of a deal breaker for this, or at least a big challenge to the further use of this otherwise really promising tweak to PRRT. But suffice it to say, people are thinking about these things 
and their thorny problems, uh, but trying to find creative ways to optimize these therapies. Uh, but now let's move on to talk about some actual new varieties of PRRT and the ways that those new varieties kind of change the, the paradigm a little bit. And the first one is changing how uh, these agents interact with the somatostatin receptor. They still bind that same receptor, but they interact in a different way. We saw earlier how regular PRRT, there's that Trojan horse analogy where we sort of trick the tumor cell into taking up this radioactive SSA. Turns out about 75% of those molecules get internalized into the cell, and about 25% just sort of stay stuck on the outside membrane of the tumor cell. So that's regular PRRT. There's a new type of PRRT that uses somatostatin receptor antagonists, which just interacts with the receptors in a different way. And one of the sort of incidental effects of that is actually most of that antagonist PRRT doesn't go into the cell. It stays stuck out on the cell membrane. And it, that's weird, actually, because we always initially thought that the radiation had to get inside the tumor cell to really have its maximum effect. But some early clinical trial data is showing hmm, maybe that's not needed. So here's one of these uh, studies that made us think that. And again, this is using the antagonist PRRT instead of agonist, which is the regular PRRT. They gave this new antagonist PRRT to 51 patients, most of whom had actually already been through regular PRRT before. And the response rate was about a third of patients, which if you'll recall is higher than for regular PRRT, which is under 20%. And there were no severe toxicities of any kind. And another thing I think is kind of crazy about this particular study is that 72% of the patients in this study had such low uptake on their like pre-treatment dotatate PET scans, their uptake on the, in their tumors was so low, they wouldn't have actually even qualified for regular PRRT based on that imaging. So this kind of opens up, in addition to being a new kind of compound, opens up kind of a new range of net patients who might be able to benefit from PRRT, which is kind of cool. Now the next difference that some new PRRT agents have is a different type of radiation. And so with this puzzle piece analogy here, we're talking about that little radioactive egg in the nest. You can just swap out that egg. So lutetium is the one that we commonly use and that emits what's called a beta particle. Some new agents are swapping out that lutetium for an atom that emits alpha particles. So beta particles are small and fast and they travel kind of far, but they can only do a little bit of damage. Alpha particles are big and slow, and that means they can actually do kind of a lot of damage at their target, but also that they don't travel very far in the body. And the fact that they don't travel very far in the body actually might be good because it might mean that they don't affect the normal nearby tissues as much. They may cause less collateral damage. And this has been really promising in clinical trials. So here's 32 patients. All of them had already had regular beta PRRT, and over half had actually progressed while they were on PRRT. So they were basically resistant to regular PRRT. They got alpha PRRT with actinium, and well over half of them actually had a response. And again, that's compared to under 20% of patients uh, who get beta PRRT. And importantly, there were no severe toxicities, even with this increase in efficacy, which is exciting. So that's why there's kind of a lot of buzz right now about alpha PRRT, maybe maybe threatening the crown of regular or beta PRRT. And last, I want to explore some new treatment combinations with PRRT that are being looked at with the rationale that, hey, if two different treatments are effective individually, why can't you combine them together to see if they have an even bigger effect, right? If PRRT works well, and we know something like, let's say, Everolimus works well, hey, can we put them together? Maybe it'll be, maybe they'll be even better together. So PRT has been combined with Everolimus, for example. Um, and a trial that looked at this found, as you might expect, a higher response rate with the combination than with either one alone. But unfortunately, there was also a lot more toxicity than with either one alone. In other words, a lot more kind of bad side effects than either one alone. In fact, all patients required that Everolimus be stopped or dose reduced because of the significant toxicity. So that seems to be there seems to be a trade-off here by, you know, you go up on the, on the efficacy, you may also go up on toxicity with these combination therapies. PRT has also been combined with chemo. So this control nets trial is doing this and their initial results are better response 
but more side effects than either treatment alone. So are you sensing the theme here? This is kind of a common theme with these combination treatments. The next interesting combination, this one is a, is a pretty new one. It's PRRT with what's called a PARP inhibitor. Now, what the heck is a PARP inhibitor? Well, that is a drug that prevents a type of DNA repair. And why is that interesting? Well, remember the strategy here with PRRT, right, is you, is you give it, it's radioactive, and it works by damaging tumor cell DNA with the radioactivity. If you also use a PARP inhibitor, then you're going to prevent, the, you've just damaged the, to, the DNA with radioactivity, and now you're giving a drug that's going to prevent that damage from being repaired, right? And so hopefully the tumor cell will die as a result of being unable to repair the damage that the PRRT has done. And this has been super promising in preclinical studies. And there's actually a clinical trial in humans going on right now at the National Cancer Institute, and I imagine some other locations as well. So we'll see if that bears fruit in reality. So a few takeaway points here. Uh, PRT use is expanding and improving. And personalized dosimetry may allow for treatment optimization. Somatostatin receptor antagonists are promising, although some may have more toxicity than agonists. And alpha emitters can potentially overcome beta resistance. And lastly, the combination therapies may increase the effectiveness of PRRT, although we have to be careful that it doesn't also increase the toxicity. All in all, though, the future is really bright. I hope that this gives you some sense of that. There are a lot of people thinking about this, playing around with this, and, and I think that uh, we have a lot to look forward to in this space. So. I would like to thank very much the, my incredible mentors, Tom Hope, Emily Bergsland, and the amazing UCSF PRRT team that's headed up by Sheila Lindsay and Rebecca Miro. Also, a special thank you to patients who enroll in clinical trials. Honestly, cancer will not be cured without patients who enroll in clinical trials, so thank you. And thank you so much to the organizers to, for having me and to everybody for your attention, and I hope you have a great rest of the evening. Very interesting information, and thank you, Dr. Lon Heath. Next, from our co-sponsor, University of Chicago Medicine, Dr. Oz Ahmed, an Associate Professor of Radiology at the University of Chicago Medicine. He is board certified in Diagnostic and Interventional Radiology. Dr. Ahmed will discuss new treatments and trials in interventional radiology. Mm. Hi everyone, my name is Osman Ahmed. I'm an interventional radiologist at the University of Chicago. And today I have the pleasure of presenting to uh, you all about updates in interventional radiology um, and or interventional oncology. And the reason I say interventional oncology is because interventional radiology is a subspecialty of radiology, but even within radiology or interventional radiology, we um, have a lot of people who really focus on oncology or treating patients with cancer, and that's known as interventional oncology. And that's known as minimally invasive imaging methods to treat cancer specifically. And we really target the tumor directly to minimize collateral damage. It's not surgery. So uh, some of the advantages of the minimally invasive procedures we do include quicker recovery and a shorter length of hospital stay. And you know the, the procedures that we perform are really boiled down into two major categories. One are called intra procedures where we actually go through blood vessels and we kill tumors through those blood vessels. And the other type of procedure is known as percutaneous procedures, where we actually just take needles and guide them directly outside the body, through the skin, directly into the tumor to destroy the tissue using either heat or freezing-based methods. So where interventional oncology and neuroendocrine cancer, or NET, really sort of intervene is primarily in the liver. That's because NET patients often have metastatic disease to the liver, and that's really one of the primary places where cancer will spread uh, in patients with NET. And fortunately for interventional radiologists or interventional oncologists, the liver is an organ that can really be treated by both of these intra-arterial or percutaneous treatments that we have. So when we talk about these trans-arterial or intra-arterial procedures, what we're trying to do is we're actually doing a procedure called embolization, where we're actually shutting the tumor blood supply down. And the reason we can do that is because the liver has a very unique blood supply. 
it gets blood from two different sources. One is from the portal vein. That's about three-fourths of the normal liver gets its blood supply from the portal vein. And about uh, one quarter of it, the blood supply comes from the hepatic artery, which is an artery. However, tumors that grow actually get, it's, it's actually reversed, where almost all the blood supply from a tumor in the liver is actually from the hepatic artery as opposed to the vein. So if we can go in and shut the blood vessels down to the liver, then we actually can kill the tumor without really effectively damaging the normal liver that much. And so this is what this looks like. You know, the, the arteries are kind of like branches of a tree. And we go into the branch that feeds the tumor. And once we get catheter or a tiny tube there, it's known as a catheter, we can inject a myriad of things. And depending on what we inject, that's what the procedure is known as, known as. And we'll sort of highlight that here. So here's a uh, sort of a cartoon schematic of the liver. And there's a, a big tumor there, like kind of a ball. And you can see the, uh, the branches of the artery look like a branches of a tree. And you can see there's specific trunks um, uh, or branches feeding that tumor. Um, this is what this actually looks like on a CT scan. This is a reformatted image. You can actually see the tumor. You can see the branches that feed the tumor, and then you can see branches that go uh, away from the tumor. So what we do is what, what's called an angiogram, where we take a, a tube or catheter directly into the liver, and you can see here this is what that looks like now, an angiogram where we're, where we're looking under live x-ray to, to visualize the branches. And this yellow arrow indicates that we are going to take a small tube, uh, a microcatheter, all the way up into the branch that feeds that tumor. And then this is what, you know, and again, on a sort of a cartoon level, this is what this looks like. Now that we're here, we can inject uh, different types of things. So if we inject chemotherapy, that's called chemoembolization. If we inject radiation beads, that's called radioembolization. And most frequently with net patients, we inject something called just bland beads or grains of particles known as bland embolization. And as I mentioned, um, this is known as bland embolization. And the reason we like doing bland embolization with, with net patients is because we really get what's called an ischemic effect, meaning we can actually, because the tumors in net get a lot of blood supply, if we can shut all these blood vessels down, we can use really, really small particle beads. These are 40 microns. So we're talking, you know, at a very, very small level, we can really cause uh, what we call ischemia or necrosis or basically tissue death of those tumors. So what does that look like? Here's an example. Here's a, a patient who has greater than 80% of their liver replaced by tumor. And you can see there uh, all those basically white, bright objects in the liver there. And fortunately, what's interesting about the liver is that it's a very resilient organ. So the liver is actually uh, only needs a very small amount to sort of do well. But because the liver is functioning normally, no matter how much tumor a patient has, we can go in and do these intraarterial type procedures. So this patient, this is what the angiogram looks like. You can see here, I've sort of outlined here all those little light bulbs that I showed. Uh, that's what it looks like on the angiogram. And then this is what it looks like afterwards. We inject a bunch of beads and you can see here now all the blush, all that dense tumor blush staining is gone. And so that's what we're aiming to do. We're trying to preserve the blood flow to the liver, but we're trying to take out all the blood supply to those tumors. And this is the follow-up. This is what this looks like. You see less tumors and you don't see that they're enhancing anymore. So that's compatible with dead tumors. So some of the tumors disappeared and then some of them are just completely dead and but just kind of rotting there. So here's another example. This is a patient I recently treated. She had uh, liver metastasis on both the right and left lobes of the liver. You can see here the arrows are outlining there's multifocal tumor here. So again, just like a light bulb, these light up bright white there. And then this is the angiogram. We're going to take a catheter into the right hepatic artery first. So typically I divide the treatments up into a right and left, and we separate that by one month. And you can see here, once we select that, you can see again, see all this dense tumor blush that we talked about here. So because of uh, all this tumor blush, we're going to embolize that with the beads that I mentioned. And this is what it looks like again. You can see here, after embolization, all that blush is gone. And we just uh, still have the trunks are still are there, but the leaves, basically all the blush of the tumor supply is gone. This is one month later, then we bring the patient back. We treat the left side. You can see that we place the catheter now in the left hepatic artery. This is the other side of the liver. And this is what it looks like afterwards. And again, you can see that there's no more flow. The blush is gone. And this is what the patient MRI looked like after uh, a month from there. And this is, uh, shows that there's all dead, shrunken tumor. So again, the light bulb has been burnt out. So there's no more tumor that's active here. So this is a really, really nice result. Now I want to focus on percutaneous ablation. Ablation, as I mentioned, is where we take a needle and we directly put it into a tumor. It's a very attractive option because it has really, really good outcomes. It really minimizes the collateral damage. 
The response rates are actually very similar to surgical resection. So burning or freezing something is almost as equivalent to just actually physically removing it. Um, and so because of this, it actually has a curative potential. So we really like to do percutaneous ablation if we can offer it for patients. And this is an example of what a percutaneous ablation looks like. So you can see here, there's a focal tumor right there that I've highlighted with the red circle. And then so under, we bring the patient, we put them in the CT scanner. And again, we can see the tumor there again. We put a grid on the patient and then we guide a needle into the tumor. Uh, this is a very simplified, you know, I've, I've obviously just shown you in three slides what does take some time. It takes about an hour or so, you know, to get that needle in there perfectly. But once the needle's there, we put it in the target. Uh, we typically do something called microwave ablation for most of our net patients. And that's where we're actually burning the tumors away. And that's what that looks like. It's a very small needle. You can see that it goes to the skin. We just put a Band-Aid on the patient's skin when we're done. And then you can see here, again, the light bulb has been burnt out. Look at what was lighting up is no longer lighting up. It's a dark hole there. And so that's a cavity of dead tissue. Now, the limitations of ablation mainly are that you can, because we're, we're putting needles in patients, we can only do this for a few lesions and only when they're small. The ablation needles can only burn a certain size, usually up to three and a half centimeters or four centimeters. So you can only have a few lesions and they, can be, uh, they can't be that big. Uh, so aside from that, there's a lot of challenges with ablation. And there's some certain challenges that I'm going to talk about that, that will be sort of the focus of today's talk is, you know, how can we um, overcome some of these challenges with ablation? These challenges include that the tumors can be very difficult to visualize. The other thing is that tumors near critical structures like blood vessels or adjacent organs can be damaged if you burn or freeze them. Um, and then even though it's minimally invasive, still it requires uh, a needle going through the skin. So there's always a risk of bleeding or infection. So I'm going to focus on these three things and what the improvements lately have, that we've sort of been developing, you know, in our field to sort of overcome these. So we've developed methods to improve the visualization of these difficult to see tumors. We have ways to now improve safety of ablation uh, of tumors near critical structures. And then there's also potential future advances that, that we're really excited about uh, where we can actually do ablation without actually puncturing the skin at all. It's a completely non-invasive uh, way to do ablation. So uh, methods to improve visualization, as I mentioned, small tumors are, can be very difficult to visualize, but these are the tumors that are actually ideal for ablation because they're small. So unfortunately, Bill, if you can't see a tumor, you can't place a needle accurately within it to treat it. So um, it's, it's a little bit of a you know, tricky situation. So we now have some advances that we're using in imaging to help improve visualization. There's many different advances actually, but one of the ways that I'm gonna um, talk about is something called angio-CT, where we actually take a CT scanner and we combine it with a traditional X-ray suite. And what that allows is using X-ray, just like we were doing those intra-arterial procedures, we can actually take a catheter into the arteries of the liver um, with the live x-ray, and then we can inject dye to light the tumor up. Then, just like we were doing our ablations before, we under the CT scanner, we can actually visualize the tumor very easily and then place the needle accurately. So here's an example. This is a very small tumor that was metastatic to the liver. You can see here, you can barely see it. The, the arrow really helps here to kind of help visualize it. And then we bring this patient for ablation. And uh, you, normally we, we can't give dye to a patient during an ablation because it, the, the dye will just wash away. So it's very difficult to see again, barely imp imperceptible. So uh, this uh, would potentially be at risk for a, an incomplete ablation. So we catheterize the artery that feeds the, the tumor there and we inject the dye to visualize it. Because we can do this all in the same room, we can actually now put the patient in the CT scanner again, and you can see the tumor is very easily seen. You don't need the arrow anymore to sort of visualize it. So again, now we can position the needle into the tumor with the dye to visualize it, and we can, we can burn it away. And you can see here now we have a dead sort of cavity, and here's the initial CT afterwards that showed no active tumor. Um, so now I sort of almost routinely do this for most of my ablations for my patients. What about tumors that are near critical structures? So as I talked about, most ablation that we're doing for cancer is thermal. We're either burning it, we're freezing it. And as I mentioned for NET, we're, you might, we're primarily burning tumors using a technology called microwave. And microwave is very effective, but it has a potential to burn or damage critical structures like bile ducts, gallbladder, nerves, intestines. So there's a lot of critical things in the liver that we don't want to burn. Now we have some newer technologies that are non-thermal, so they don't utilize heat or freezing energy. And that really sort of reduces or lessens the risk of damage of these critical structures. And one of the main technologies that we're starting to use is something called irreversible electroporation or IRE. 
And with IRE, we're actually just, we're, we're basically electrocuting the tumor. We're, we're putting needles actually around the tumor more often than actually through them. So we actually just bracket the tumor and then you sort of surround it. And then you basically apply this high voltage electrical current. And that actually just pokes holes in the membranes of the tumor and that causes cell death. And the beautiful thing about IRE is that it doesn't impact all tissues equally. It actually has um, the potential to protect or not disrupt structures with a lot of collagen. And unfortunately, all the things that we want to protect are structures that have collagen, like the, like the blood vessels and the, the bile ducts, and as well as the blood vessels. So here's an example. This is a patient who actually had a, a tumor in the pelvis that were asked to ablate. And you can see it's, it's close to the rectum and there's a lot of nerves in the area. And so we proceeded with IRE and you can see what we did was we actually bracketed it like a triangle. And you can see here the tumor, as I've shown here with the red circle, actually is in between the triangle. So we bracketed the tumor with the IRE needles. This is what it looks like. And again, so very minimally invasive. The needles are just around. We just put a Band-Aid at the end. And again, this is a very short ablation cycle. And then you can see here there's some gas in the area. That's the black area that shows that the tumor is, has been essentially electrocuted. So finally, can we make ablation even safer? So no matter what the current technology we use for ablation, it still requires placement of one or more needles through the skin. And there's a new technology that we're actually fortunate to be working with called hysteropsy that actually may eliminate the process and make the procedure for ablation completely non-invasive. And the way hysteropsy works is it actually uses ultrasound energy. And ultrasound, you know, we typically know ultrasound as a diagnostic tool. We can look at structures in the body with an ultrasound. But ultrasound actually has the potential to treat patients if you harness the energy to actually create cavitation. This actually used to be a sort of an unwanted uh, side effect of ultrasound used to be cavitation, but actually harnessing that energy, you can actually create a beam of this and you can cause basically like bubbles that lead to cavitation and tumor destruction. And again, similarly to IRE, it actually has the ability to preserve critical structures that may be nearby. And it, the best part is that it doesn't utilize any radiation. So it's a completely non-invasive and no radiation. This is what it actually looks like. This is like a, a specimen that's been treated by hysteropsy. So it, it, it's like an asteroid hit this tumor and you created this actual cavity of space. And the first in-human studies were completed in Europe, and the first trial in the U.S. just started over a year ago. There's only 10 sites, and we're fortunate to be one of them. We recently, uh, a few months ago, treated our first patient. This is what it looks like. So it's not even a sterile procedure because there's nothing going in the body. You can see we place a water bath over the patient, and then it's a robot. And you can see here, that's the bubble cloud there in action there. The ultrasound, you can see the red is where we are harnessing the energy. And that's a picture of me on the right there, uh, basically just watching the procedure after we position the ultrasound into the area of interest. So in conclusion, interventional therapies are non-surgical treatments that directly target tumor to minimize the collateral damage. As I mentioned, there's both intra-arterial, which we use for patients who have usually a lot of tumor, as well as percutaneous, which is usually for patients who have uh, a small amount of tumor. And then, as I mentioned, percutaneous methods include various types of ablation to directly place needles into the tumor to destroy them. And recent advancements have helped us uh, improve visualization, as well as uh, protect critical structures, and then also potentially allow us to do these procedures completely non-invasively. I thank you for your time and your attention, and I welcome any questions. Feel free to email me or contact me on Twitter at any point. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to welcome my co-chair again. Dr. Xavier Koikin will explain the risks and benefits of surgery when managing a net diagnosis. Mm. Good morning again, and welcome back to our session on risks and benefits of surgery. Obviously, I'd like to thank the uh, NetRF again for being able to present today. And I hope I'm going to make sense uh, in clarifying some of the controversies that uh, we have around surgical resection, especially for metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. So um, obviously, when a tumor is localized, Surgical resection at this time in 2022 still remains the only potential for cure. So what that means that if you have a tumor, for example, in the head of the pancreas, as you can see here on the left side, a Whipple procedure would be needed to resect it in most cases. Sometimes we can also enucleate these tumors, but that is the way to resect these tumors when they are localized. And it is the only way to give us a chance to cure you uh, is through complete surgical resection. 
of the primary tumor. Obviously, um, there are two ways to approach uh, surgery when the tumor is localized. One is laparoscopic or robotic, or we call this minimal invasive, and the other one is open. Um, I know some of you have seen this slide previously, but essentially the difference between an open laparoscopic approach or robotic approach is that an open operation just has a big incision and a laparoscopic or a robotic approach usually has several smaller incisions that are not directly connected with each other. The open approach, because it has a larger incision, usually has a little bit more pain. The patient has to stay in the hospital a little longer, but it's a little easier to handle the tissue occasionally because uh, we handle it ourselves with our uh, hands. And the laparoscopic approach is smaller incisions, like I said, less pain, usually a little short in the hospital stay because of that. But we use either the robot um, or a camera with thin long um, instruments. So the tactile feedback is not quite there. It's good for most operations, but certain uh, surgeries, we really still need to do an open approach. So since we're talking about risks and benefits of surgery, well, if you have a, a surgical resection for a tumor that is localized, so for the primary site, the complications depend on what is getting resected. So if you have a piece of your stomach or the duodenum that gets resected, complications include a gastric or duodenal leak, bleeding, infection, and then a delayed gastric emptying. There are more than that, um, obviously, but those are probably the four most common. If you have pancreatic surgery, depending on whether it's a distal pancreatectomy or a Whipple uh, procedure or just an enucleation of the tumor, you are talking about complications including a pancreatic duct leak that can happen in up to 30 or 40 percent of patients that undergo a distal pancreatectomy, for example. And again, bleeding and infection and delayed gastric emptying are some of the complications. If you have colon or small bowel surgery, an anastomotic leak, meaning um, anytime we take a piece of bowel out and we reconnect it, it could fall apart. It happens rarely, but that is a known complication. It can also cause an abscess or infection, uh, sometimes requiring even a reoperation. And then bleeding, and by bleeding, I mean a return trip back to the operating room is also a major complication, but it happens rarely. And then when you talk about the liver or gallbladder surgery, bile leaks, bleeding, and infections, uh, rarely requiring reoperations are also things that again could happen with these type of primary surgery. But I would argue that the risks of these operations obviously are worth it in the majority of the cases because, again, remember, when your tumor is localized, surgery is the only way to cure you. So this is really what we are aiming to do during surgery. Now, the question just becomes, does surgery make sense from a risk-benefit ratio for tumors that have already spread outside of the vicinity of where they started? And if you look at uh, what are the most common places where these tumors spread, Usually it is the liver, as you can see here, up to 45 or 42% of pancreas or small bowel endocrine tumors have liver metastases. And then if you look at liver tumor burden, so that is the amount of tumor, if you quantify it in your liver compared to the rest of your liver volume, of the healthy liver, so to speak, we definitely know that your survival is limited or decreased if you have a lot of tumor burden. So if, let's say, more than 50% of the liver is replaced by tumor. So the number one and two causes of death in neuroendocrine tumor patients are often related to either overwhelming liver tumor burden or complications from the primary tumor that is probably especially true for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. For example, those tumors, if they are large, can cause obstruction, perforation, and bleeding, requiring emergent surgeries that, again, are always more difficult to perform than planned elective cases. So for treatment options of metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, we have systemic therapies, which I'm sure uh, you've heard about plenty, including the octreotide, the targeted chemotherapy, PRT, and then we have the liver-directed therapy, and surgery is one of them. Liver transplant is very rarely used, mostly talking about surgical debulking here. This is one of the algorithms that we use, for example, to see when does it make sense to do an operation and what are all the other options available. And you can see here there's a multitude of things we can do. So again, whether surgery makes sense or not, it doesn't just depend on the risks and benefits, but also I would say at hospital where you get treated. And so I can't emphasize enough that it is important to go to a multidisciplinary neuroendocrine tumor center that is experienced between these diseases. This is a paper we published a while ago. Most of you have seen it. 
just stating that the sandostatin, the lanreotide, the averolimus, the PRT, all great therapies, but uh, we have very limited data on how well it works for liver tumor burden. And again, remember, a lot of patients run into trouble if their liver tumor burden becomes really high. So why surgery for liver metastases? Well, the theoretical benefits are that it is the only potential for cure. So let's say you only have two lesions in your liver and you take them out. Well, you may be cured. It happens rarely though, because mostly there are smaller lesions that we can't see during surgery that eventually over the years after surgery will grow back. Surgery has in some studies has shown that there's some advantage in terms of survival over no surgery. That is due to the surgical debulking concept. These are small progressing tumors that grow very slowly. And so by taking out most of the liver tumor burden, you can reset the time clock and put patients back three, four, five years uh, where the tumor was smaller because it takes that long for them to grow. Surgery can achieve major tumor burden removal. Complications are much decreased. Surgery may make systemic therapies like PRT better. And then symptoms almost always improve with surgery, meaning if you have, let's say, a serotonin-producing tumor, uh, you have a lot of diarrhea, and it's hardly controlled with the octreotide, most of the time when we debug the liver, it actually helps significantly with symptom control. So here's some studies from the University of Iowa, um, where you can show that even if you only debug 70% of the tumor, you still have a really good progression-free survival. What that means is that the tumor burden that you remove is important during surgery, and we always aim to try to remove greater than 90%, but even 70% has been shown to make a difference. And then the number of lesions that you take out doesn't really matter. It's more the amount of tumor that you take out that is associated with long-term survival. So even if you have extra hepatic metastases, as we showed in one of these studies here, you can see in green where those patients' survival that did not have disease outside of the liver, where it had spread and the primary tumor. And then in black, you can see those uh, that had um, extra hepatic disease, but um, underwent surgery for the liver, and they still did a lot better than those that did not undergo surgery. So the bottom line is, even if you have a few bone lesions, it shouldn't preclude you to have uh, surgery to your liver as long as you're a good candidate. So is it worth it? Is it worth doing the debulking? That's really the question here, right? And I would say that it depends on many things. One is the tumor biology, right? Some tumors are more aggressive and you don't want to go to a major operation if three months later the tumor is back. Second, surgeon experience. Obviously, this operation has to be done safely and you need to be able to leave the hospital with a great quality of life and doing very well after surgery. Otherwise, it's not worth it and patient um, expectations as well. And by that, I mean that, you know, we're doing this operation not with a curative intent most of the time, but rather to really take most of the tumor out, prolong your survival and make additional therapies work better. So is liver surgery safe? Well, the University of uh, Iowa and the Ashner group here have published their data a while back in 2015 and 2017. And you can see here that the rate of major complications grade three or four, grade three means you need some form of an intervention, uh, it could be a drain placement or repeat surgery, is anywhere from sort of 10 to 20 percent, according to their data. And we have looked at our data recently, where we looked at 52 patients that we had debulked in a row. And you could see here that the median number of lesions that we debulked was pretty high, it was anywhere from uh, 16 and a half to 22, depending on pancreatic or small bone or endocrine tumors. The uh, total number of lesions uh, was greater than 1,000, and only a small percentage of patients required blood transfusion. So we can do this very safely and very dryly by not losing too much blood. If you could see here that the total number of complication was not different, whether you had a pancreatic or small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, and also whether you debulked one to five lesions or even greater than 25 lesions, no difference in complications. And here again, similar to what um, other people have shown, our complication rates are around 10% or even a little less for the higher complications. So we can do this safely. We had no mortality in this case series. And the number of days you stay in the hospital after surgery was roughly six to seven days on average. Only two patients out of 52 had to go back to the operating room, either because of bleeding or because of something else that had to be fixed.
And then one of the unique things of our study is that we looked at whether all of these debulking uh, surgeries affected liver function. That's what patients are always worried. They come to me, they're like, well, am I going to have a complication related to my liver not functioning well? And because we keep the inflow and the outflow of the liver intact and we shell these lesions out one by one, I'll show you in a second how we do that. Really, the synthetic liver function measured here by the bilirubin or the INR climbed a little bit, but not anywhere near to liver dysfunction like territory. And as a matter of fact, dropped very rapidly uh, by the third day uh, after surgery. So the liver takes a little bit of a hit, but really not much of a hit. It does regenerate quickly. We can see that in the platelets and the phosphorus that drops after surgery for the first two days and then comes back up rapidly afterwards. That is actually the liver using these to regenerate quickly. So, for example, on the left side, a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, and on the right side, a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. You can see some lesions here, the white arrows, what they look like on MRI. This is on the left side, three months after surgery. They look similar, but they're actually not the same because we ablated some of these lesions and we resected them. And so now they don't have any enhancement anymore. You just see holes in the liver. And three years after resection, still nothing had changed here in this particular patient with the small bowel. And about 15 months after surgery was the same for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patient. And it is worth to say that pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patients usually tend to have a little bit of a quicker recurrence rate than small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, although not necessarily dramatically quicker. But you can see here that these are just holes in the liver that slowly but surely close over time and sometimes stay over a long period of time. And we can see them uh, over many years, but it doesn't affect liver function. So as a good surgeon, you got to know when to operate. And more importantly, I would even argue, you got to know when not to operate, right? So you can see here on the left-hand side, if you have a lot of tumor greater than 25 or even 50%, you don't want to operate because there's no way I can take all of this out, keeping enough healthy liver for the liver function to work. If there are really tiny liver lesions that are all over the place, then they may be very hard for me to find and I can't remove them. I may have to wait until they grow. And then if you have carcinoid heart disease, you got to get usually your heart fixed prior to that. If you have major thrombosis or blockages of your vessels going to your liver, bad idea to operate. The liver is not going to be happy regenerating with impaired blood flow. And then uh, if you obviously poor performance status or if you have a polar differentiated or high grade tumor, you're not going to want to operate. So this is a liver divided in inflow and outflow that you can see here. And these dark spots are tumors, for example. So we look at distribution, is it in one lobe, both lobes? We look at the relationship to inflow and outflow to try to see whether we can scrape them away from vessels or whether we have to resect a major vessel. We look at how much tumor burden you have overall. We look at individual tumor size. This is a good example here on a patient that has a huge tumor in the right lobe here, this big dark circle. You can see the small amount of liver that's left over here that's probably not going to be enough liver to live normally with a healthy liver function. So there are techniques that we can make this left side grow here before we actually take out that big tumor. And then we ablate these tumors and this is how it would look like. So here you can see on the video, this is a liver that has all these holes that we put in and all these lesions that were resected. And then there were additional lesions deeper down that we used the ablation device for. So we basically fry these lesions that are really deep in the liver that we can get to. So this is what it looks like. This is an example of the tumor that was removed. Now, if you have a symptomatic small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, and by that I mean on the right side here, you can see this big nodule here. Then the question becomes, if you have cramping, uh, if you can't tolerate food, you know, the question becomes, if you have that liver here on the left side that is full of tumor, right? And I told you that's too much tumor for me to remove. Is it worth doing an operation again? Are the risks too high or are the uh, benefits outweighing uh, the risks here to remove this primary tumor without addressing the liver? And my argument is absolutely no question. Yes, because if you have a symptomatic small bowel neuroendocrine tumor or a large neuroendocrine tumor in the small bowel that you know will cause issues, like perforation or bleeding or obstruction, you want to take that out even if you can't debulk the liver. And there's uh, a lot of data, including some of the papers we have looked at, that supports this. And it supports even perhaps removing primary tumors in patients that are asymptomatic. Like here, for example, this study, you can see small bowel neuroendocrine tumor. The black line is patient survival with the primary tumor removal without any other surgeries. So no liver surgeries, just a primary tumor. The red line is the one without primary tumor removal. And it's true for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors as well.
And this study here, for example, out of California, just showed that on the left-hand side, your survival was better whether you removed the primary tumor without any uh, liver treatment, so surgery to the liver or uh, liver-directed therapy with um, interventional radiology, and also with liver uh, treatments. So no matter what you do, some people argue that the primary tumor, even if it's asymptomatic, should come out. But that doesn't always make sense, right? I mean, if you have a big tumor in the head of the pancreas, it requires a Whipple operation, which is a huge operation, much bigger than a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor a resection, or much bigger than even a pancreatic tail resection. And you have a liver chock full of tumor where you can't do anything about it surgically. I'm not sure that doing a Whipple would really improve your quality of life that much, especially if the tumor is not causing any major issues. So again, I think it's a case-by-case -case basis of removing the primary tumor. Um, but I would argue that with small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, if they are large masses, they should be resected. So lastly, I will say one more thing is that there's some newer literature from a couple of years ago now and more and more data coming out that removing the primary tumor may also improve systemic therapies like PRT. This is an example from Europe, over 900 patients where the green curve is the probability of an event, meaning of progression. And you can see here the blue curve is uh, less probability, so you want the probability to be low, and it's definitely lower both in those patients that had the primary tumor resected in the pancreas, small bowel, and lung neuroendocrine tumors. So the last slide is about a quick question that patients always ask me, do I need my gallbladder removed during neuroendocrine tumor surgery? Again, it's a risk and benefits thing here, but if you have metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, and we expect that you're going to go on long-acting octreotide, um, which a majority of patients will need during their lifetime if the tumor is metastatic. There's a study out of uh, Sweden that showed that your chance of requiring gallbladder resection down the line because you have been on octreotide is almost 25%, so one out of four patients, versus less than 1% if you are not on octreotide. So octreotide definitely can cause gallstones and complications related to the gallbladder. So our recommendations are that we should remove the gallbladder if we address the liver with surgery doing surgical debulking because we expected that you're gonna go on octreotide at some point. But there's no need to take out the gallbladder if you're not having surgery at that point. So then we can just observe you, unless you have obviously symptoms related to your gallbladder. So again, in conclusions, I would say that surgery for localized neuroendocrine tumor is the only curative treatment and the risks of surgery outweigh the benefits in almost all cases. So there's no question there in my mind. I think that surgical debulking of liver metastases with resection of the primary tumor, although it's not curative, it has been associated with improved long-term survival. And definitely, I didn't talk to, about that too much, but symptom control as well. So that to me is definitely worth the risk in most patients because liver debulking using these new techniques is very safe. Major complication rate is 10% or less in experience center like the University of Chicago. And I would say that we know that it doesn't affect liver function and it's very effective at decreasing liver tumor burden. Therefore, in well-selected patients, surgical benefits, in my opinion, outweigh the risks. Um, not if you're 95 years old, you know, not if you have had three heart attacks. These are not the type of patients that we want to bring to the OR. But uh, if you're well selected, you would do very well with an operation like that. And then lastly, surgery for primary tumor with unresectable distant disease should be considered for symptomatic primary tumors for sure. And occasionally or selectively in tumors that are not symptomatic. So I'd like to thank again Dinera Ref uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact our program or to contact myself directly. Here's my email, and I'm looking forward to uh, join you uh, later for a treatment sequencing panel. Thank you very much. Mm. Welcome back again, and uh, thank you for joining us. I'm uh, Dr. Xavier Koitkin from the University of Chicago Medicine, and we have our fantastic uh, morning panel that is joining us today for the uh, treatment sequencing uh, panel. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Oz um, Ahmed from uh, the University of Chicago, who's our IR specialist, Dr. Uh, Courtney uh, Lawn Heath, who is our uh, nuclear medicine from the University of San Francisco, Dr. Andy Liao uh, from the University of Chicago Medical Oncology, and then Dr. Jennifer Shan 
uh, who is also joining us uh, as a medical oncologist from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. So we'll dive straight into the treatment sequencing panel slides. Um, as you probably know, um, there are some guidelines out there that uh, we use as clinicians uh, to be able to, or at least to try to figure out um, how we treat uh, certain uh, cases and in what uh, sequence or in what order uh, we treat uh, those patients. But if you look at, uh, this is sort of a simplified version of things, if you look at the red part here, which is for metastatic disease for neuroendocrine tumors, there are a lot of different options that we can fall back on depending on uh, different uh, cases. And so I hope that these four cases we're going to talk to you about today will um, illustrate how different uh, things can be from one patient to another. So let's jump right into the first case. This is a 49-year-old female who presents with flushing, diarrhea, weight loss, and um, abdominal cramping after eating, uh, usually about 30 to 60 minutes after eating. She gets an abdominal uh, CT and an MRI. And the CT shows, as you can see here, that there is a um, roughly two centimeter tumor in the distal small bowel that's partially occluding the lumen of the small bowel. And then the MRI uh, with EOVIST shows that there are multiple liver metastases. Uh, the radiologist calls them innumerable. Uh, the blue arrows just point to some of them, but essentially all the dark spots here in the light gray liver are tumors. So let's start. Uh, so, so the patient gets a biopsy, uh, a liver biopsy, which shows a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. It's a grade one tumor. The KI-67 is uh, less than 3%. And obviously this is stage four because the tumor has spread. So serotonin is quite high at uh, 1,330, chromogranulase 4,119. And uh, as good clinicians, we got a dotated PET-CT next, which showed that there was mostly uh, disease within the abdomen with uh, most of the disease here in the liver, quite a bit, actually a lot of disease. And then the primary tumor here with some lymph nodes in the right lower quadrant. So Dr. Um, Chen, what would you do next? for this patient when she comes to your clinic? You know, I think um, what's interesting to note about her case is the extent of liver disease that she has, as well as her symptoms that are compatible with carcinoid syndrome with the flushing and diarrhea. I think whenever there's pain, especially after eating, you have to worry that there may be partial obstruction related to the primary tumor, or even if there is mesenteric disease, some element of mesenteric ischemia that's causing some pain after eating. So I think in a case like this, there is a clear role for somatostatin analog therapy to help with her symptoms of carcinoid syndrome. But I would also uh, make sure that she is seen in a multidisciplinary setting like this to especially get surgical input regarding um, resection of the primary tumor with the pain and symptoms she's having. Great. So that's exactly what we did. We started on somatostatin um, analogs and her symptoms improved minimally. She states that her flushing got a little better, her diarrhea minimally improved, but the cramping remains. So um, she was, like you suggested, discussed at a multidisciplinary tumor board like we are having right now. And um, the general consensus was exactly as you suggested that perhaps because the cramping didn't really get better on the long acting octeotide and because the CT suggested that there was uh, quite a bit of narrowing of the small bowel uh, lumen where the small bowel tumor was, she, she could potentially benefit from um, surgery. Now, uh, Dr. Liao, why um, did we get a preoperative um, echocardiogram in this patient? Does this matter before we would take somebody to the operating room? Yeah, I think for anyone who has carcinoid syndrome, like uh, this patient has, we would always worry about carcinoid heart disease. So, um, you know, tricuspid valve abnormalities. And so, it's really to help um, with the surgical planning to make sure that, you know, if they have any underlying carcinoid heart disease, that that, that gets addressed first to optimize the, the surgical risk. Thank you. So um, we took it to the operating room, did a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy. We took out a gallbladder to prevent gallstone since she was um, ex expected to be with that much liver disease on long acting octreotide. We also did a liver retrosection just for the pathology. Uh, report and the pathology essentially remained the same as the liver biopsy. So this was a well differentiated tumor, low grade. So at this point, after the surgery, 
She says her cramping improved, but the, the symptoms are still pretty bad. So as a matter of fact, she thought that uh, the flushing and the diarrhea really didn't get much better since we talked to her last. So now I would ask uh, Dr. Uh, Lon Heath, uh, what are the options here um, for somebody that has uh, bad flushing and diarrhea despite being on long-acting octreotide? Would, would you consider PRT for a patient like this, just for symptom control? That's a great question. So we know PRT does help uh, with these exact symptoms. And um, the patients in the Netter one um, trial that led to that sort, sort of was the big trial to demonstrate how well PRT works, uh, were kind of in similar situations to this patient in that they had avid tumors like this, and, uh, but their symptoms were progressing on or at least persistent on uh, somatostatin analogs. Uh, and also, I will say, if we could go back to um, a view of the case, thank you. Um, the You can see there that there's really excellent uptake in the tumors here. And so from that perspective, the patient would be an excellent candidate for PRRT. One thing I would say, though, one hesitation that I would have for doing it right now, you know, PRRT is not something that you can do too many times. You want to do it at the right time when it's going to um, have the most benefit. Um, and for and for right now, it seems to be really, uh, especially now that the patient's had surgery, it's pretty much exclusively in the liver. And that kind of suggests to me that there might be a role for something directed just to the liver uh, and that we might hold off on PRRT until the disease has spread outside the liver. Perfect. So that puts a beautiful transition to our colleague, Dr. Um, Ahmed. So Oz, what do you think? Is this a candidate for liver-directed therapy? And if yes, uh, what what type of liver-directed therapy? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you stole my thunder a little bit in, the, in explaining that um, this is a ideal candidate for liver-directed therapy specifically because, um, you know, at this point, uh, most, if not all, of the tumor burden is confined to the liver. You know, with liver-directed therapy, we have two primary treatment options that we that we use, one being uh, percutaneous ablation and the other being intra-arterial therapy. In this situation, because there's multi uh, multifocal tumor throughout the liver, we would opt for um, intra-arterial therapy so we could treat uh, or blanket the liver with, uh, with our therapy. So in this situation, I would choose something like bland embolization where we would go and catheterize the hepatic artery doing an angiogram um, and uh, then uh, inject uh, bland beads into the uh, right hepatic lobe, uh, and then followed by one month, uh, treat the left hepatic lobe. Fantastic. And as the surgeon on the panel, I will add that this is way too much tumor for me to take out. So even if I wanted, and I would be really motivated to try to get it out, this is um, a lot of liver tumor burden, right? So this is definitely not something that I would uh, operate on. So this is what we did. Uh, we got liver-directed therapy. This is actually a real case. And you see here that it actually got a lot better already. So the tumor actually not only stabilized, but shrunk, and her symptoms dramatically improved. Her serotonin dropped to 350 from over 1300, and she was a really happy camper uh, for quite some time. And she did continue the octreotide and uh, had a really good uh, quality of life. So Dr. Uh, Chan, would you continue the octreotide in this case, or because you said, well, the directed therapy work, serotonin drop, you know, we can stop it? I would also continue with the somatostatin analog. I think many patients who have carcinoid syndrome still benefit from continuation of the SSA to reduce hormone secretion as much as possible. And it also may in the long run by getting better hormone control. Also, we would hope um, prevent development of longer term complications from having sustained high levels of hormone like development of carcinoid heart disease or mesenteric fibrosis down the line. So I tend to continue even if there is improvement after embolization. Perfect. Okay, so two and a half years later, she has a return of her symptoms. She comes back to clinic, obviously um, complaining this time again about diarrhea and flushing that gets worse. Her serotonin increased again to 900. So what now? Dr. Liao. Um, so I would want to get another set of imaging to see what's going on. Um, this sounds like she has disease progression. So it looks like she does have disease progression. 
Um, yeah. So our MRI within should the liver, increase. but outside the liver. Right. So there are two tiny foci uh, that, that you could see here that now are um, outside the liver. And like you suggested, Dr. Liao, clearly there has been progression in the liver. Dr. Heath, what are we doing now? Well, you know, I will say because the disease is still mainly in the liver, I would still probably at least run the idea by my interventional radiology colleague to see if they felt that there was something else that was indicated. However, the fact that it is starting to spread outside the liver is a sign that it might be time to consider PRRT. And just as on the prior study, it's tough to see those little lesions and the uptake probably looks really low because the lesions outside the liver are so little, but the lesions that are good enough size, we can see there's a lot of uptake there. And if, and something, if something's that bright on the PET scan, you also know that a lot of PRRT is going to go there and, and treat those tumors. So I, I think this could be a good time to consider PRRT. This is what we did. I, I took Oz out of the equation there. <laughs> Although you're absolutely right. I think it would have been uh, absolutely reasonable to go back to our interventional radiology group. And I would even add, and maybe you can comment on that, uh, Oz, is there a limited amount of time you can use blend embolization in a patient or can you use it over and over again? No, I think those are all fantastic points. And I think it's very reasonable to proceed with PRRT here, as mentioned, for the reason that there is evidence of disease outside of the liver. But again, I think um, if we wanted to make an argument for, um, you know, repeat intraarterial therapy here, given that probably, you know, 90, 95 percent of the disease is still localized within the liver. I think that's totally reasonable. There's two things that I would want to make sure of. One would be I'd want to make sure that on this MRI that the, the tumors that there is arterial enhancement, because what we are targeting is the uh, arteries of the tumor. And so we want to make sure that there's arteries feeding, which, uh, again, usually is the case, if not uh, almost always is the case. And then the second is I just want to make sure that the liver is still healthy and by healthy, meaning one to make sure that the liver function tests are acceptable and that the patient's in a good health status. Just like our oncology colleagues uh, assess the health of the patient prior to treatment, we do the same exact thing. We want to make sure our patients are healthy and that specifically the liver can withstand another round of basically targeted therapy to the liver. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Case number two, 55-year-old male presents with flushing, diarrhea, and lower extremity swelling. Biopsy, same as before, well differentiated. No endocrine tumor, low grade, stage four. Liver biopsy is here. Serotonin 1500, a little higher than the previous patient. Chromogranate 3554. Patient gets a CT scan, which showed um, a few small lesions on the right side, but mostly really um, a pretty large lesion here, as you can see on the left side of the liver in the left lateral segment. The CT scan shows clusters of lymph nodes uh, around one of the mesenteric vessels that supplied the small bowel, and the primary tumor was not seen on the CT scan. This time, again, we got an echo, uh, especially because of the dilated lower extremity. Like Dr. Liao suggested before, um, we want to be uh, uh, wary about these patients that have high serotonin level to make sure that they don't have any uh, problems with their heart valves before we um, intervene further. Dr. Liao, what would you do for this patient at this point? So I think it's time to get our cardiology colleagues involved um, to see how we can um, address the tricuspid uh, regurgitation um, if the valve needs to be fixed, because that can impact future treatment options, including surgical options. Good. So I, I assume we all agree that we would start a monocteotide as well. Uh, we did get our cardiology colleagues involved and they uh, actually recommended a valve replacement because the valve was so damaged and the patient was severely symptomatic that this was the only way that they thought uh, would be reasonable to manage uh, him. And so that was done successfully. The patient did well afterwards. What now? Now we got the patient on octreotide, the heart valve's fixed. You saw the, the tumor burden, which is mostly... Uh, in the left lobe of the liver, and there's a primary uh, tumor there in the small bowel. Dr. Chan, is this something you would uh, send to your surgeons, or is this something that you would watch for a little bit, or what would you do? I would, um, in a case like this, definitely have one of my surgical oncology colleagues weigh in, especially with that large mass involving the left lobe. That may be something that can be resected, and then you've really essentially debulked a lot of the liver disease 
and at the same time also get an opinion about um, potentially also removing the primary tumor. It's not symptomatic now, so it may not be quite as critical as in the first case, but still I think something to potentially consider. Fantastic. So he was on three months of octreotide. We did some repeat imaging, no surprises, everything stayed stable. And by the way, we did get a, a dotated pet just to make, uh, uh, make Dr. Uh, Lon Heath uh, happy. Uh, she got four small, uh, or he had four small foci of uptake in T5 and T6. But really, like you said, Dr. Chen, the bulk of the disease was in that left lateral segment. And so because of the symptoms, um, he was presented to me and I thought that exactly like you, that I thought it was very reasonable to go ahead. And, you know, since I'm in the abdomen, I may as well just take the primary tumor out at the same time. So, and the gallbladder as well. So that's what we did. And the patient actually um, had a really good recovery, His serotonin level normalized actually after surgery, uh, proving that uh, most of at least the functioning tumor mass was in that left lateral segment and he became asymptomatic. Now, do we continue SSA after this? Uh, Dr. Liao, any idea? I would say it depends on how much of the disease the surgeon was able to resect. Generally, if it's most In this of the case, disease, I was very um, confident, 99%. Then it may be, uh, you know, if she's asymptomatic, her serotonin is dropping, then it may be time to take a break from SSA. Uh, Courtney, any recommendations on your end on this? We do know SSA is fairly benign from a side effects standpoint, so I feel pretty ambivalent about whether or not to continue. Um, I think it would be fine to continue, but I understand the rationale behind stopping. Um, definitely don't think PRT is a good thing at this point. Dr. Chan, uh, do you continue um, octreotide after uh, surgical debacle into your institution? Yeah, I think in a case like this, I think there are a you know, the two options that have been discussed, continue or stop, are both quite reasonable where you've debulked most of the disease. I will say that I do have a low um, low threshold for continuing SSA in patients who we know have functional tumors, and especially in this patient who had carcinoid heart disease. I think the long-term hormone control can be beneficial. So I think my inclination would be, even though you've removed much of the disease, to probably continue. Okay. So um, in this case, actually, um, we had a discussion with the patient. He, he wanted rather not have the shot in the butt unless, uh, unless he had to on a monthly basis. So he, he, uh, we continued with just close serotonin and MRI uh, levels. So there was no recurrent disease in the liver, as you can see here. And then about two and a half years later, he developed a cervical mass that his wife noticed uh, he went to a local ENT doctor who performed the resection, and lo and behold, the resection showed a metastatic well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, this time grade 2 with a CAS 67 of 5%. We obtained a dotate PET CT, and this is what it showed. So as a hint, since I can't show you the entire PET scan, almost all of the disease, except for a few small lesions in the liver, but most of the disease is truly in the uh, skeleton, so in the bone here. So what now? Andy? Right, you can con consider resuming that. If he was on SSA and this developed, then maybe consider PRT. So we started him back on his SSA. Serotonin level grew or climbed mildly. Um, Jen, is this something that you see often that the functioning part of the disease is the one that's in the abdomen or the liver and that patients with bone metastases don't necessarily have a high serotonin level and don't have that many symptoms like this patient? Yeah, I think a lot of the symptoms with carcinoid syndrome are probably driven by um, hormone that's secreted by liver disease. So I think it's not entirely surprising, especially where it's now bone predominant, not so much in the liver. So two years after octreotide, he gets a surveillance to the PET CT, and this is what it shows now. So we're going from, you know, fair amount of liver disease to really a lot of, excuse me, a fair amount of bone disease to a lot of bone disease. Courtney, what now? I think now would be a great time for PRRT. Like the previous patient, this patient has very strong uptake in their tumors. Um, sometimes people ask me, you know, in patients with a, a really a, an extensive amount of tumor in the bones, like we see in this patient in the after picture, sometimes um, other physicians will raise concerns, you know, are you worried treating this patient with PRRT um, that they'll have more toxicity 
um, to their bone marrow than patients with less disease. But but really, we've not we've not really seen that. I think I, I think the disease must have to be really uh, extensive and really just replacing all the marrow. Uh, to see that uh, we do know there's a, some marrow toxicity to begin with with uh, with PRRT, but um, somebody with this much disease, even though it looks like quite a lot, um, as long as their uh, blood blood cell counts were good at baseline and, and were just strong enough to for us to be safe to do PRRT, um, I'd expect them to be able to handle it just like anybody else. Great. So that's what we did. We started him on PRRT. He had four cycles, and so far his disease has been stable. So I think this first two cases of small bowel neuroendocrine tumors just showed you that things may appear very similar on the first biopsy, but the course can be very different. And there's a lot of factors that plays into that. Liver tumor burden is certainly one of them. Avidity on the PET scan is one of them. You know, whether somebody goes to the operating room is one of them. So there's a lot of things that can change our management as we move along through uh, the lifetime of a patient, depending on what the tumor does. Um, and I think uh, what is really astonishing here is that I think we all come from different institutions on the East Coast, on the West Coast, and in the Midwest. But ultimately, I think we all pretty much came up with the same therapeutic plan here. So I think that that, that shows you that there is certainly variability, but that overall, there are some certain ground rule, I think, that we all follow. All right, so let's move on to case number three. It's a 62-year-old male with a newly diagnosed pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. The KI67 is 7%. It's a grade two tumor. And one of the uh, things that I like to hear the least uh, when I read a radiology report um, is innumerable bilobal liver metastasis and a pancreatic tail mass. Not because I'm worried about the patients with innumerable bilobal uh, liver metastasis, but because I often wonder if the radiologist stops counting after 20. So, so I like to see the scan before I really consider this as um, innumerable. But in this case, all credit to our radiology colleagues, there were a lot of liver metastases, as you can see here with the blue arrows. And if you would count them, they would probably be well above 50. So we obviously don't expect them to count each and single one of them. You see a pancreatic tail mass on the right imaging there. That's about two and a half centimeters. So he was started on octreotides, right? We don't have to go through that again. That's sort of the standard therapy and returns three months later for surveillance imaging. So the repeat MRI shows overall stable liver lesions, but there's some progression of the primary tumor, uh, mildly from two and a half to 2.9 centimeters. Dr. Liao, what would you do now? If it's mild progression and patient's overall clinically stable, you know, you could continue treating, but then this may be a situation where you want to talk about the role of surgical treatment. So discuss a multi-D tumor board and then send to Dr. Koiken. Great. So in this case, it, he was discussed, and I thought that um, he would get more bang out of uh, the buck, so to speak, if we were able to shrink his uh, liver disease. And so uh, we came up um, with the idea to start in on Cape Tem, which is a chemotherapeutic agent, and to continue up to your type. So we continued for a total of 12 months, and lo and behold, the next MRI showed there was a significant decrease in size of multiple hepatic lesions and also of the primary tumor. I mean, you're looking at now just really less than 10 uh, lesions that were left. So he had a really amazing response. Dr. Chen, what would you do in this case? I think where he's gotten a really excellent response um, to chemotherapy, it's worth, again, discussing back at the tumor board to think about resection to try to debulk some of this disease. It is actually really interesting. It's always hard to predict when you start chemotherapy what type of response you're going to get. But I think especially in these excellent responders, it is, I think, worthwhile thinking about debulking where some of the lesions that you'd seen before you don't clearly see right now. So. I'd be curious to see what your thoughts were when you re-reviewed the case. These were exactly our thoughts. So actually, um, we did repeat a dolitate PET-CT just to make sure, you know, that there was nothing uh, outside of the liver or no significant tumor burden that was outside of the liver and the pancreatic tail mass, just to be sure that it was worth our while going back in there. And we did take him to the OR. We did a distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, and liver debulking. 
And you could see here, we could only find 15 lesions. So we ablated six, resected nine. We also did a cholecystectomy. And interestingly, the pathology showed that it was a grade one tumor now and not a grade two anymore. This is pathology from both the primary as well as the liver metastases. So Dr. Liao, do you see that, that patients sometimes can have a lower grade after being treated with chemotherapy? We do definitely see a lot of heterogeneity, um, depending on where you biopsy, depending on where there's the primary tumor versus the metastatic lesion, and even depending on, you know, different metastatic lesions. And sometimes you can even see differences uh, in terms of how these lesions light up on, for instance, on PET scan, you know, some of them will have more somatostatin uh, receptor expression, they will light up more brightly. And then if you biopsy them, they may be of lower grade or lower KX67 than um, the faster growing uh, liver metastases. So definitely a lot of heterogeneity. Okay, we're back to the same question of octreotide. Yes, so, you know, Dr. Chen, any ideas or advice? Do you treat your pancreatic yeah, neuroendocrine tumors differently than your small bowel neuroendocrine tumors after surgical resection for metastatic disease? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, as you look at this case, and if all disease that you knew about preoperatively has been resected, there are no, you know, hormonal syndromes that you're trying to control with the SSA. I think it's very reasonable to stop treatment and just just follow. Um, so I would probably, in this case, favor stopping and watching very closely. Okay, so as what we did two years later, no evidence of disease progression. That's what his liver looks like. So that's a really good outcome. So now we got a 55-year-old female with a newly diagnosed pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Same startup, so to speak. Uh, it's a grade two, casting 77%, stage four disease. The imaging again shows innumerable bilobal liver metastases in the pancreatic tail mass. Now this is what the liver looks like. There seemed to be perhaps even more tumor than in the previous scan. And this is what the dotatate pet looks like. So you can see the dark spots are all liver disease. So he was started on long-acting octreotide, same story, returned three months for surveillance imaging. And now there's some mild progression of the liver tumors. What now? Oz, is this something that you would recommend liver-directed therapy for? Yeah, I think a uh, good question. And I think the same principles still apply here. So um, we don't really discriminate based on tumor burden as long as there's still functioning liver there and the liver function is normal, meaning the liver function tests are okay and the patient's overall general health status is okay, we can still do an intra-arterial therapy again because there's more than a few lesions here. There's obviously multiple lesions here. I would favor something like a bland embolization if we wanted to go the uh, liver-directed therapy route. Andy, any role for CAPTEM? Yeah, definitely. You know, um, for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, it's, it's one of the therapy options that can actually produce a um, objective response. So meaning tumor shrinkage and in a relatively short amount of time. So it might be, you know, someone, let's say you worry about them going to liver failure and you need that response. That may be a situation here where you would start the Cape Town. Dr. Chen, what do you think? I completely agree with um, with Dr. Liao. I often, as I evaluate patients, when I see that much to liver, liver disease at the outset where the liver is already enlarged, you worry about progression and how much more progression the liver might tolerate. So I sometimes start out with chemotherapy when there's a large burden of disease like this. So that's what we did. We started chemotherapy um, and actually, repeat imaging after six months of K10 showed mild progression of disease still. So then we went the IR route and the bland embolization was actually very successful in this patient. He had first the right and then the left lobe that was embolized. And you could see here that there's definitely decrease in, in his overall liver tumor burden. But unfortunately, nine months later, he again experienced progression of disease in his liver. So what are we doing now, Courtney? Kind of like a couple, a few cases ago, I would still probably give my interventional radiology colleague uh, the right of first refusal here. Um, also, at, at my institution, um, in addition to, to bland embo, um, they do a lot of Y90 in situations like this. And so it, they, it's possible that interventional radiology may uh, feel that another treatment, another round of treatment is indicated. Um, but this could potentially be a time to consider PRRT. There are a couple of things that 
I would think about though in this patient. If there's not too much healthy liver left, sometimes we worry um, that radiation may damage some of the healthy remaining liver, um, but that's not a concern in this patient. The other thing that was giving me pause as, as we were talking through the case is, you know, generally when patients ha get Cape Tem, there is some uh, risk to the bone marrow. And when patients get PRRT after getting Cape Tem, they may be at increased risk of marrow toxicity. Doesn't necessarily mean at all that they can't get PRRT or shouldn't get PRRT, but it's just one of those things that I would want to pay extra careful attention to, uh, to their blood counts uh, over time. Outstanding. So let me just turf it right back to uh, Oz. Oz, two points that Courtney brings up. The first one is uh, giving you s sort of the, the right of refusal again, right? So I think it's a very good point. Is there any time frame that you say, you know, liver directed, it's been nine months ago. He had good, good response granted, but it's nine months too short to go again. Or is there any time frame where you would think oncologically wouldn't make sense to retreat? That's my first question. And then my second question is, what about Y90? Do you use it for nets? Yeah. So, yeah, to address your first question, I mean, um, you know, a lot of what we do isn't uh, terribly scientific, you know, uh, in terms of the, you know, standardized protocols and algorithms. Um, it, you know, to be honest with you, it's a lot more, it's a lot more common sense. So if a patient's doing well after a bland embolization, you know, for example, I mentioned when we do whole liver treatment, we separate each half of the liver, so right and left by one month. And I've done patients where I've done right, left, and then gone back and then the right again after, you know, uh, sequential months just to, to sort of, you know, finish off the job, if that makes sense. So, I, you know, to answer your question, I would, I would pursue treatment after nine months, again, provided the patient was healthy and did well the first time, which in this, in this case she did. You know, when it, one does it not make sense, I think it's more going to be based off of that, of that MRI. If I don't see a lot of arterial enhancement or it looks more heterogeneous or the liver function is not doing well, uh, I would probably, you know, shy away from that and then sort of rediscuss with, with uh, Andy and, and, and you at, at, at the tumor board. Um, with respect to Y90, I think we tend as an institution, as a group to shy away from it. I think as a society of interventional radiologists, most academic interventional radiologists are not performing Y90 because of the risk of chronic hepatotoxicity, which is a very fancy way of saying that we cause liver cirrhosis uh, with Y90. Um, with Y90, we use it for a lot of other tumors. And unfortunately, you know, those patients don't have a long lifespan. And with NET, because those patients, our patients do have a long, longer lifespan, they actually unfortunately see the side effects or the toxicity of long-term Y90, which is basically this hepatotoxicity or cirrhosis. So we tend to shy away from it. Now, with that said, I, I know we were chatting very recently about um, some encouraging data from Penn about, you know, combining Y90 with Cape Tem for grade two nets. But again, a lot of that's early and, and you know, it remains to be seen. But I think the, the nice thing about net is that we have a lot of treatment options available to us, including PRT. Um, so I, I tend to stay away from it, you know, in the short term. Courtney, um, do you have any um, reservation about giving PRT to someone that had Y90? So uh, the word here is cumulative radiotoxicity. Short answer is yes. Um, I do have reservations uh, worrying about cumulative radiotoxicity um, to, the, to the liver. Uh, this is something that um, just because of the practice patterns at my institution, though, uh, we do end up actually doing PRRT very often after Y90, sometimes after multiple rounds of Y90, and generally have not, you know, seen too much uh, radiation-related hepatic toxicity, um, but we haven't seen zero do you know what I mean? So we do occasionally right. have a case. Um, it's usually when the patient is heavily pre-treated, pre um, has gotten multiple rounds of therapy, multiple rounds of Y90, um, potentially a by low bar Y90, um, even you know over the, over various time points, and still has a really high burden of uh, avid disease in the liver. So I think it's like a lot of factors that have to come together at once. But it, it's not it's not my first choice in. Uh, that sort of setting. Great. And then Andy, um, so this patient, right, so had Cape Tem, didn't really respond, actually progressed mildly on Cape Tem, initially responded well to liver directed, but is there any reason why you would want to rebiopsy this tumor at some point? I mean, the time frame is relatively short. 
on how quickly the patient is progressing? I mean, is this something that you would consider? Yeah, um, every now and then you see someone's disease kind of take on an unusual course, like, you know, indolent for a few years. And then after like Cape 10 and PRT and all these treatments start to take off more rapidly. And when that happens, sometimes I, you know, I, I usually kind of re-image it and consider re-biopsy because every now and then you find this uh, fast growing clone that um, may even be poorly differentiated. So. So in this case, we did a repeat liver biopsy, actually our interventional radiology colleagues did this for us, and showed this time that it was a, still a well-differentiated tumor, but it, uh, the KI67 was 30%. So it went from sort of a grade 2 to a grade 3 tumor. Uh, while we had the biopsy specimen, we also did a next-generation sequencing panel on it, and it showed an ATRX mutation, which is very common but also a uh, loss of RB, which is a gene that um, has been associated with um, other types of tumors and sometimes can be associated with pancreatic endocrine tumors. The dotatate shows, again, mostly uh, disease within the liver. It's still avid disease. Jen, what do you do in a patient like this? Many of the conversations that we've already had with respect to should we go back and re-embolize, should we consider PRT, I think they're still very relevant topics to discuss given that it's liver predominant. Um, I think when we tend to see higher grade disease, I think we also can consider chemotherapy. Um, this patient has already had capecitabine and temozolomide, so I don't think we would necessarily return to that. But other regimens that do appear to be active with well diff grade three neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas include regimens like Folfox. Um, but I, I, I do think that there also is a role for PRT and liver-directed therapy. So I think those need to be discussed again in a multi-D um, setting just to figure out which one would be most appropriate now for the patient. So Courtney, what's your experience? Uh, I think that's the last question. But what's your experience with uh, grade 3 tumors and uh, PRT? We definitely do uh, PRT in well diff uh, grade three tumors. And uh, essentially like for us, it's, it's not the grade that's important or the KI, it's, it's the imaging and how hot are the tumors on imaging. And are there any significant tumors that are not hot? on on dotatate because then we worry that they that we're going to be treating some tumors and then other tumors are going to be uh sort of growing it not in it like are not being treated and so they may grow out of control um so but uh, barring something like that as long as the uptake is as good as it is in this patient we're very comfortable treating um grade three patients uh do generally find um, that response rates are somewhat lower and the duration of the response tends to be somewhat less um, but particularly in patients like this that have already been through a few uh, lines of therapy this can definitely buy some time and this might just be the right time to do that in this patient great i think that's it so um, i'd like to thank you very much um, i hope that we showed our patients that again tumors can appear very similar in the beginning but that things change uh, dependent obviously on tumor biology, um, every tumor may look the same um, under the microscope, but may behave uh, very differently or respond very differently to therapies. So I hope that this was useful to you. I'd like to thank, of course, the panel here for your outstanding comments and insights on how you would treat these patients. And uh, we will see each other uh, very soon for the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you to Drs. Koiken, Chan, Liao, Heath, and Ahmed for sharing your expertise with us this morning. As Know Your Nets continues, we have talks on some of the most popular topics according to our spring survey. Now we're going to jump into our patient panel. Hi, I'm Jessica Thomas. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm also the director of patient education for the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation, also known as NetRF. At NetRF, we value the importance of net patients hearing from other net patients. We want you to know that you are not alone in your journey. I'm thankful to be able to introduce you to our patient panel today. We have Hector Perez. Hector is 37 years old from Utah. He's a tech professional. 
He has a busy family and a busy life, and he's also living with Ned. And we have John Michael, who's 43 years old. He's an attorney, an entrepreneur. He lives in Indiana, and he's newly married, so he's living a busy life these days, too. And we also have Jan Ritazzi, who's 69 years old. She's from Indiana, and she is a strong advocate and a great peer and loves to work with other people that are living and navigating life with nets. So today we are going to um, cover a couple of questions and I will leave the discussion um, and the questions, but uh, we will start with Hector. And um, first question is, is I would like for you to please share when you were diagnosed and your reaction that you had when you um, learned that you have nets. Sure, yeah, I was diagnosed in 2017, and um, my reaction was, um, I think, a rush of emotion, um, a lot of different thoughts uh, that, that, that came to mind, a lot of thoughts specifically around my family, um, that being the focus, as I had two little boys, I had a newborn at the time, and um, it was it was like a ton of bricks and it was difficult um not something that that you would expect um i think to to hear at i guess at the age that i was in the early 30s right uh, but it was it was um overall just very emotional um and, and very difficult i would say thank you for sharing how about you john Sure. So I was first diagnosed in August of 2018. And thinking back to that time, I think I think I share a lot of what Hector had mentioned um, he went through. But I, my situation was a little different. At the time, I was a single 39-year-old. Uh, and, you know, I, I, you never know how you're going to react to that sort of thing. And I can honestly say mine surprised me. I, I went numb. Like my own entire body went numb, and I think for the first month or so, um, I was like a kind of a walking zombie. Honestly, I mean, I, I obviously I went through various phases since then, but for the first month, it was just a, a huge sh shock and a lot of questions. And luckily, I, I have a great support group, loving family, some friends in the medical field. Uh, one of the gentlemen that actually um, helped facilitate, I guess, the diagnosis and, and help really a dear dear friend of mine that helped me uh, understand some of those things and then the options and a long-standing rule for me is I, I don't look up anything online myself because um, i can go down various rabbit holes and i would never sleep if i did that so i just listened to what the professionals told me and i was uh, happy to learn about all of the various treatment options etc so but at first i mean i was honestly it was a big shock and i was numb and then kind of took it from there Thank you. Um, you hit on our second question, and I'll, um, I'll ask it in a second. But, um, but Jan, I um, wanted to ask you as well. I was diagnosed in 2016 with a well-differentiated, functional, grade 2 neuroendocrine tumor in the small bowel with metastases to the lymph nodes and liver. So it came as a shock to me, but yet um, I was more worried about the diagnosis and once I talked to my oncologist up here and he said he wasn't familiar with this uh, type of cancer, he was going to send me to a specialist in Chicago, Dr. Quaken. I was relieved to know that I was going to be with somebody who could deal with this cancer. Thank you for um, for sharing. I definitely hear a theme that um, that shock and, um, and you know was something that's very common for all of you, and you all are seeing um, um, net specialists, which is really great. So our second question is, um, what advice do you have for um, someone that's newly diagnosed um, with nets? And we will start this time with um, with Jan. Well, number one. I would say see a net specialist. I can't tell you how many times someone's come to our support group and said they had surgery with a local doctor, they were told they were cured, only later to find out they had metastases and have to deal with another surgery. So um, see a net specialist. Second, keep up with surveillances and blood workup because they will catch when they come back or reoccur. 
educate yourself. Be your own advocate. I'm going to tell you, NETRF has more videos, some of their former conferences, podcasts, and a guidebook for patients and their families. You can order it now. You'll get the digital copy now, and printed version will be available soon. And I, I felt very fortunate to have been asked to review the former booklet and to give some suggestions. Thank you so much. That is great advice. Um, Hector, um, how about for you? What would you tell someone that's newly diagnosed? Um, take it in stride. And um, I think the more and more you learn about the disease, um, for me anyways, in my case, um, uh, going along with what Jan mentioned, seeing a specialist was, was so, so important. The conversations that I was able to have with my doctor versus previous doctors, oncologists, surgeons, um, I, my feeling of hope, right? The, the hope that I had, the options, um, the, uh, the understanding of what this really meant uh, to my future gave me a, a lot better, um, I think, view of what I was up against. Uh, whereas before it was doom and gloom, um, I saw a lot more light and, and was happy um, seeing a specialist and having that information come from them. That's great advice. And how about you, John? So I was lucky enough to, as I'd mentioned earlier, have a, a dear friend of mine that put me in touch with the right people. Um, Dr. Quicken, as was mentioned earlier, Dr. Liao, the group over at University of Chicago. Um, you know, and I, I've always been an athlete, an entrepreneur, and a very active person. So, you know, my steps were to compartmentalize, uh, give it the attention and respect that it deserves, but also not let it um, define who I was as a human being. Really finding out about the treatment options and then doing everything I could to live my life to the fullest uh, and, and not let this... Um, overwhelm and, and, and like I said, define me for, you know, the rest of my life. So what I hear here is um, getting a, um, seeing a specialist is important, um, educating yourself, having a good support team and knowing your resources, and then also moving forward and living your life. So I'm going to um, start with John and I want to ask you, um, how do you define um, living well with your net? Right. So I do everything I can and nobody's perfect, you know, and I do my best to give it the time it deserves and it and to, and to knock it out as best I can. But at the same time, um, you know, move on with life and, and just live and enjoy those moments. I mean, we all none of us uh, kind of knows what tomorrow is going to bring and just be positive and try to live a good, clean life, make the best of things. Um, don't let it, you know, put me in a bad place where I've actually never let it really put me in a bad place. Right. I said, I, I, I said, uh, you know what, when I, if, and when I do go out, um, of this world, I'm going out with my boots on. Right. And I'm going to be live every minute of every day to the fullest. And, uh, I mean, I, I was diagnosed, um, you know, four years ago, they said I probably had it for five to 10 years before I ever even saw symptoms. Right. And the amount of things I've been able to do and accomplish, and I'm not trying to beat my own chest here, but like I have nephews that I love and I've seen eight of their birthdays since then. Right. And um, done all I recently got married. So, you know, giving it's a very obviously serious situation, but, you know, giving it the time it deserves, doing what the specialists tell me to do and then really going on and enjoying every minute of every day uh, of my life. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I'm going to ask um, Jan the same question. Um, how do you live well with, um, with your nets? Well, I'm fortunate in that after surgery, I have been ned, no evidence of mm -hmm. disease. So my cancer is not my worst problem. Um, I'm going to tell you to try to stay healthy because I learned the hard way um, this lesson. So I'm, I've been seeing doctors for sleep hygiene, for uh, diet, and I'm trying to stay active now. And I try to walk two miles a day, and not only for my health, but in memory of a long term net patient, Bear, who advised all of us to do that to walk two miles a day. 
That is great. And Hector, how about you? How do you live well with your nets? You know, like what was mentioned just now, um, focusing on the things you love and, and not letting this change that, right? And, and define who you are. Um, I too grew up, you know, in athletics and was very active and um, I continued to do that. Um, and so that enjoying family, I mean, you, you really get to, I think from a, whether it's a good thing or not, you come to value the things that truly matter. I think in our case, a little earlier on than, than maybe some would. And, and that comes down to, you know, valuing those little moments with family, um, I have two boys and my wife and, and just any milestone, you know, that I get to participate in now, it's, it's enormous because I think about how much it means. And that's really how I, I try to view things is um, focusing on the good things, doing the things I love as much as I can and um, not letting it hold me back. Those are all really good points. I think there's the, a silver lining sometimes that um, disease and illness can help us to pay attention and, um, and focus on what matters most, right? It also can give us the opportunity to be fully present and even find ways to just to focus on living and living in the moment and enjoying things. Um, I heard that from all of you. Now, um, the next question I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with Hector. Um, but could you um, what is something that you wish you knew back when you were first diagnosed? Something that you know now that you wish you knew back then? Yeah, good question. Um, I think quite honestly, it goes back to getting correct information about what I was diagnosed with, right? Um, like it was mentioned earlier, sometimes it's very easy to get sucked in to Google and you just start looking stuff up and, and it's a, it's a rabbit hole, right? And there's information out there that is very helpful. There's information out there that maybe isn't so helpful. And, um, really what I wish I would have known earlier on is, is really the, the focus of how important it is. And I'm going to mention it again of, of why it's important to go to a specialist over just a, you know, a general oncologist, right? Cause it, really does matter. There are really a lot of important details to know about um, and resources, right? That they can point you to, to, to really have a true understanding of what you're up against. So um, just finding the right information from the right places. Absolutely. And I, I just want to make a, um, a plug here real quick that NRF um, has a, um, a direct link on how to find a, um, a net specialist. And that's important to know if you're looking for a net specialist. But John, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, what is something that you know now that you wish that you knew when you were first diagnosed? Two things, right? There's the medical side of it, uh, as I want to kind of uh, term uh, uh, define this. And then there's the life side of it. The med from the medical side, um, just knowing all of the treatment options that are available and all of the amazing work that's being done and, and the testing that's being done out there and developed for future treatments and um, those sorts of things. So I, I wish I would have, you know, because I, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I did go through a big, uh, it, was, it was shocking and, and the numbness and the, um, walking around like a, a zombie for a month that came with it. But if I would have known the, the treatment options that were out there, I think that would have really calmed some of those anxieties. Number two is the life side of it where I, I, I you know, you don't know how long you have on this planet or et cetera. Right. But um, all of the future um, positive experiences and things that would, that were still going to come and, and um, I was going to experience after this big um, life-changing event, right? Whether it be birthdays or holidays with loved ones and, and all of those sort of life experiences, because, uh, you know, this is oftentimes very treatable and there are a lot of options out there. So. Very good. And, and Jan, how about you? 
Oh, a few things. Uh, keep the hope because just in the six years I've been in this, new things have been um, have come about like the Dotatate scan, PRRT, uh, Landria Tide. So things are being researched and thank goodness for NETRF who sponsors uh, the research. Also, um, connect with a support group. You know, I had the wrong impression what a support group was in the beginning. I just thought, yeah, you go there when you can't deal with your cancer. And that's not true at all. It's a, a you know, a group of people who speak the same language, who um, have a camaraderie. And, you know, no one needs to take this cancer journey by themselves. Also, I wish I would have known about resources that were available in the beginning. And just a few in addition to the NETRF, if I can mention them, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, CCF, LACNETS, NCAN, HealingNet, NorCal, and forgive me if I've forgotten some. Thank you, Jan, for sharing. One thing I have learned about the NET community is that um, this is what it is. It's very much a community. There's a lot of resources. There are a, um, a lot of um, programs. There's a lot of education and, um, and you are not alone. So um, the next question I'm gonna ask is I would like for our, um, our panel to share a silver lining, a unexpected surprise, something that they have that's been positive that they've learned about themselves or their experience while living with nets. And we're going to start with Jan. I think my silver lining has been meeting new people, um, not only in my own support group, but I do a support group through LACNET. So I'm meeting people from California um, who I never would have met otherwise. Um, also, I think uh, a stronger connection with the family because you do know this is a, a serious thing to deal with, so. Thank you, um, and John, how about you? A silver lining, unexpected gift. Sure, well, first of all, Jan, uh, sounds like you're doing great work, so we may need to touch base after all of this, <laughs> but um, I would say, and I don't think that it's novel to uh, this type of cancer. I think any life-changing event puts things into perspective, really. Um, I mean, I wake up every morning, I'm excited about the things that I'm going to do, the things I'm going to learn, the people that I'm going to interact with. Um, you know, after you've gone through a diagnosis and, you know, whether it be surgery or whatever, sometimes things just taste a little bit sweeter. The sky's a little bluer. Um, <laughs> you know, you hug your parents a little bit tighter and, uh, you just en enjoy and appreciate things. I mean, that's very, I understand that that can be a little cliche and you hear that a lot, but it is true. I will tell you something for me that, that maybe um, just specific to myself is I felt a real pool. I were, I lived in Chicago and I worked in corporate world and I was an attorney for, well, you know, almost 20 years. And, and I've, after I had this diagnosis, I felt uh, a real, this may get a little weird, but I felt a real draw back to getting back to earth and doing some gardening and being outside and hiking and fishing and, and just enjoying um, time out in nature. So that's one thing that's been a silver lining for myself is, you know, just appreciating things, putting things into perspective and, and spending time out in nature. Thank you. And Hector, how about you? Um, I would say relationships. I think you grow to a certain point within my family and the relationships that I have with them in a way that probably wouldn't have happened, um, you know, not having this as, as part of my my day to day. And that's appreciating, you know, my, my wife uh, and all she does and and loving and, and caring for my kids that much more. Um, and, and also, to, to be honest, my, my net specialist, my doctor, uh, who's been a, an amazing part of this whole journey, um, very appreciative of, of that relationship as well. So uh, I would say relationships has, has truly been something that, that I have gotten out of this. Thank you for sharing. May I add one thing? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like the people in my Chicagoland neuroendocrine tumor network are like family to me. I've mm -hmm. made some lifelong friends there 
and we even meet up when we don't have a support group. That's beautiful. We um, it, it does seem that um, in the face of um, something as, um, as serious as having a net that you can strengthen relationships and, um, and learn to live fully. And, um, and thank you for sharing. So I'd like to say thank you to um, each of our panel members, um, Hector, John, and Jan. Your insight, your experiences um, are invaluable. I know that we all learned something today and I am inspired just by hearing about how you live well with your nets. Now, um, we know that being diagnosed and living with um, neuroendocrine tumors can be um, a great challenge. And it's important for everyone to know that they're not alone in their net journey. Thank you so much for participating in our patient panel. Thank you for that wonderful discussion. It's always helpful to learn how other net patients navigate their diagnosis and their treatment journey. We turn now to Dr. Andy Liao of University of Chicago Medicine. He is the Associate Director of the University of Chicago's Gastrointestinal Oncology Program and the Co-Director of the Neuroendocrine Tumor Program. Dr. Liao is going to talk to us today about the past, present, and future of somatostatin analogs, a common treatment for NETS. Hello everyone, my name is Andy Liao and I'm a medical oncologist from the University of Chicago. Thank you all for joining us. Today we'll be talking about the past, present, and future of somatostatin analogs. Somatostatin analogs, or SSAs, are drugs that mimic somatostatin, which is a naturally occurring hormone in our bodies. Here are some of the SSAs that we commonly use for the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. So they include long-acting versions, such as octreotide LAR and lanreotide, and also short-acting version, such as octreotide. Octreotide LAR is given as an intramuscular injection, whereas then reotide is given as a deep subcutaneous injection. And short-acting octreotide is available as both the subcutaneous but also intravenous versions. SSAs work by targeting somatostatin receptors. So these are receptors that are found in neuroendocrine tumor cells and we can detect the presence of these receptors by doing Dota tape PET scans. More than 80% of GI neuroendocrine tumors express somatostatin receptors, and therefore SSAs are the mainstays of systemic therapy. Here are some of the side effects of somatostatin analogs. So they include diarrhea and stomach cramps. They can include steatorrhea because what happens is these SSAs actually slow down the um, pancreas production of digested enzymes, which can lead to bloating and flatulence. Other side effects include um, injection site pain and lumps. They can include gallstones, nausea, vomiting, uh, hyperglycemia, and low heart rate. Most of these side effects are transient and also mild in severity, and therefore SSAs have a very favorable toxicity profile, and patients generally have a very favorable quality of life on treatment. So we'll talk about some of the data that establishes SSAs as anti-secretory therapy. So these are um, treatments meant to reduce the hormonal production by neuroendocrine tumor cells. So this is a clinical trial that looked at octreotide LAR for the treatment of carcinoid syndrome. This trial enrolled 93 net patients with carcinoid syndrome. The patients were first treated with short-acting octreotide for two weeks to control their carcinoid syndrome symptoms, followed by a three to five day washout without therapy. Then patients are randomized to one of these four groups. So the first group got continuation of the short-acting octreotide. Second group got octreotide LAR at the 10 milligram dose level. The next group got the LAR version at the 20 milligram dose level. And then the final group got LAR at 30 milligrams. So as you can see here in the figures, octreotide LAR is beneficial both for both controlling the diarrhea and flushing associated with carcinoid syndrome. 
the treatment response rate was up to 71% for patients on the Arteriotar LAR 20 mg dose level. So as a result of this study, the recommended starting dose of Arteriotar LAR was 20 mg for the treatment of carcinoid syndrome symptoms. Lanreotide also has benefit for treatment of carcinoid syndrome. So this is the ELECT study. So this clinical trial enrolled net patients with carcinoid syndrome. There were 115 patients randomized in a two to one fashion to getting lanreotide versus placebo for 16 weeks, followed by an open label phase of treatment with lanreotide. As you can see here, treatment with lanreotide led to a 15% decrease in the percentage of days where patients needed to have short acting arteriotide for rescue therapy. And so this demonstrates that lanreotide is also effective in controlling carcinoid syndrome symptoms. Now we'll look at some of the data that establish SSAs as anti-proliferate therapies, meaning uh, looking at their role in slowing down tumor growth and stopping tumor growth. So this is a cartoon that shows how SSA work. So as I told you before, SSA bind to the somatostatin receptors present on the surface of neuroendocrine tumor cells. And upon this binding, the downstream signaling pathways within the cells get regulated, and that leads to both halting of the cell cycle, but can also lead to something called apoptosis, which triggers tumor cell death. So this is a phase three study called the PROMID study that looked at octreotide LAR. So this trial enrolled patients with mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor with grade one tumors, randomized them one-to-one -to, -one to getting octreotide LAR at the 30 milligram dose level versus placebo. And on the bottom here shows the results of the trial. So to go over how to read this figure, in the yellow curve, you have the patients treated with arteriotide LAR. In the blue dash curve, you have the patients on the placebo group. On the x-axis, you have time, and on the y-axis, you have the proportion of patients. So this trial showed that arteriotide LAR led to a median progression-free survival of 14.3 months versus six months in the placebo group. So progression-free survival means the time that the tumor remained stable from progressing. This trial also showed that octreotide LAR led to a response rate of 2%, meaning that two out of 100 patients had dramatic tumor shrinkage and the, most of the patients had stable disease. This is the phase three clarinet study that looked at lanreotide. This study enrolled patients with GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but also with neuroendocrine tumors of unknown primary. They in enroll patients with KS67 of up to 10%, randomize them one-to-one -to, -one to getting lanreotide versus placebo. As you can see here, by the time of publication, the median progression-free survival in the lanreotide group was not reached, with more than 60% of patients still with stable disease at 27-month cutoff. And this was compared to 18 months in the placebo group. The response rate is similar to our triotide is only 2%. So does this mean that lanreotide is better than our triotide? Well, not necessarily. So here is a table that um, highlights some of the key differences between the PROMID and the clarinet studies. So as you can see, the PROMID study only enrolled 85 patients and actually did not complete the intended accrual, whereas the clarinet study enrolled 204 patients and completed its intended accrual. The patient population is also different. So the PROMID study enrolled only mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor patients with KSC7 of up to 2%, whereas the clarinet study enrolled all GI neuroendocrine tumor patients and neuroendocrine tumors of unknown primary. And the KS67 cutoff in the study was up to 10%. And if you look at the results, especially in the placebo group, the PROMID study placebo group time to progression was six months compared to the progression-free survival in the clarinet group placebo arm of 18 months. So this really tells you that these are very, very different patient population enrolled in these two studies. Clinically, we know that both octreotide LAR and lanreotide are very effective anti therapies. We do know that there are different drugs besides from the method of administration. 
They also have different pharmacokinetics, meaning how it hangs out in your body after administration. So now I'm going to go over some more recent data using high dose lanreotide for patients who progress on standard dose lanreotide. So this is the phase two Clarinet Forte study. This study included patients with advanced pancreatic and mid-gut nets, grade one and two with a KXC7 of up to 20%, both functional or non-functional tumors are allowed. They included patients whose tumors have somatostatin receptor expression, and patients who have progressed on standard dose than real type, so that's the 120 milligram every 28 day dose. They excluded patients with poorly differentiated or grade three neuroendocrine tumors, patients who had rapidly progressing disease within 12 weeks of starting the standard than real type regimen, and patients who had previous PRRT targeted therapy or chemotherapy. So in this study, patients were treated with than real type at 120 milligrams every 14 days. Here are the patient characteristics. So with the mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor group, on average, they were on standard dose lanreotide for 16.4 months prior to starting study treatment. And for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor group, they were on 21.7 months of standard dose lanreotide prior to starting study treatment. Most of the patients, more than 90%, as you can see, have low KXC7 of less than 10%. And most of the patients, more than 80% of patients in, the, in fact, have a low uh, hepatic tumor burden of less than 25%. So here are the results of the Clarinet Forte study. As you can see, for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor group, the median progression-free survival was 5.6 months. And for the mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor group, the median PFS was 8.3 months. And if you look at the PFS by KS67, it seems like the PFS is longer for the patients with low KX67, so 8.6 months in the mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor group compared to 5.5 months in the high KX67 group. And for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, that was eight months with the low KX67 group versus 2.8 months with the high KX67 group. So to summarize, the Clarinet Forte study showed that lanreotide at 120 milligrams every 14 days provided clinically meaningful progression-free survival in a select population with well-differentiated grade one and grade two mid-gut and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Most of the patients in this study had KS67 of less than 10% and low liver tumor burden, and also prior long-term exposure to standard dose than real type. Now switching gears a little bit to talking about the role of SSA in lung neuroendocrine tumors. So this is the phase three SpineNet study that enrolled patients with advanced lung neuroendocrine tumors, including both typical and atypical carcinoids, whose tumors expressed the, the somatostatin receptor. They excluded patients who previously had other SSAs and also excluded patients who had prior treatments with more than two lines of chemotherapy. In this study, patients are randomized in a two-to-one fashion to get in lanreotide versus placebo in the double-blind phase, followed by open-label treatment with lanreotide. And although the study was terminated prematurely, here are the patients that are enrolled. As you can see, this study enrolled both patients with typical and atypical carcinoids. About two-thirds of the patients have low KS67 of less than 10%, and 92% of patients had low hepatic tumor burden of less than 25%. And here are the results of the SPINET study. So the lanreotide group had a progression-free survival of 16.6 .6 months compared to 13.6 months in the placebo group. The response rate was 14% in the lanreotide group. And although these results are not statistically significant, if, if you can look at the patients with typical carcinoid versus atypical carcinoid, for patients with typical carcinoid, the median PFS was 21.9 months. And for patients with atypical carcinoid, the median PFS was 14.1 months. So to summarize, the SPINET study is the largest prospective study of SSAs in somatostatin receptor positive lung meds and confirms that our real type provides a clinically meaningful progression-free survival, especially in patients with typical carcinoids. And most of these patients in the study had a KS67 of less than 20% and low liver tumor burden. Now switching gears to talking about other SSAs. So this is passireotide. So 
The previous studies that I show you are with alkyotide and nemreotide, which predominantly target somatostatin receptor 2. Passereotide is an SSA that can target somatostatin receptors 1 to 3, with highest affinity for somatostatin receptor 5. So this is a phase 3 study that enrolled patients with advanced GI nets with inadequately controlled carcinoid syndrome symptoms, randomized one-to-one -to, -one to getting passereotide versus alteotide LAR. Unfortunately, the study was terminated early due to futility at the interim analysis for symptom control. However, it showed that passereotide and alteotide LAR had similar effects both on symptom control but also similar safety profiles. And here are the progression-free survival data seen in the limited number of patients that were enrolled before the study was terminated. As you can see, the median PFS was 11.8 months in the passereotide group compared to 6.8 months in the alteotide LAR group. What's next for SSAs? So there are many studies currently being developed to examine new formulations of SSAs, but also looking at new ways of targeting the somatostatin receptor. So this includes radio-labeled somatostatin analogs like PRRT, which is covered in other parts of today's symposium. And they include novel studies such as cell therapies that target somatostatin receptors. This could also include combination therapies. So we've seen data for combination of SSAs plus targeted therapies. And there are also clinical trials on the way, such as a clinical trial of SSA plus pembrolizumab immunotherapy. And finally, future studies will also be needed to look for predictive biomarkers so we can select for the patients who will benefit from treatment. Here are some of the new SSA formulations that are in development. So they include octreotide capsules, which recently completed its phase one bioavailability study. They also include paltusotin, which is a new oral SSA formulation currently being investigated in a phase two study for patients with NETS. And this includes CAM2029, which is a subcutaneous population of SSA, currently being investigated in a phase three study compared against octreotide LAR and then reotide. And we hope that these new formulations will improve efficacy, treatment adherence, and also quality of life for our patients. So to conclude, SSAs are the cornerstone of neuroendocrine tumor treatment and can improve progression-free survival in our net patients. SSAs can also effectively control carcinoid syndrome symptoms and generally have a very favorable safety profile. And many studies are currently underway to develop new formulations and combinations to improve efficacy and quality of life, as well as to develop biomarkers to help guide more precise therapy. That's the end of my presentation, and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Liao, for that informative presentation. Now we welcome Dr. Thor Hefdonerson to discuss another aspect of treatment sequencing, cumulative treatment toxicities. Dr. Hefdonerson is a professor of oncology at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science and a consultant in medical oncology at the Mayo Clinic. My name is Thor Hafdanerson and I'm a professor of oncology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I would like to thank the organizers of this uh, meeting to give me the opportunity to speak on cumulative treatment toxicities in neurotic tumor therapy. These are my disclosures. So uh, neuroendocrine tumor therapy is very effective and uh, all treatments have some side effects. So we need to balance uh, the needs of the patients uh, against the burden of the side effects. So essentially try to weigh the uh, benefits of the treatment uh, and weigh the uh, risks and uh, side effects and uh, do some calculations in our mind to see if uh, certain treatment is uh, worth uh, the risk. Thankfully for neuroendocrine tumors, that is typically a fairly easy thing to do. So the side effects are 
typically associated with uh, the dose of the drug and how long it is given. And so if you're on a higher dose and you take it for a longer time, you may have more side effects. And uh, thankfully, permanent and serious side effects uh, of uh, neuron tumor therapy are fairly uncommon, but milder side effects certainly are not. So I find it helpful when we go through side effects of uh, uh, NET therapy to look at the different treatment types. So we can group uh, NET treatments into several main groups, and you can see them there below. So we can target the somatidin receptor either with somatidin analogs or with PRT. We have what we call targeted therapy with kinase inhibitors and mTOR inhibitors and even immunotherapy. And then we have old uh, school chemotherapy, which still has some value in patients with neuron tumors. And then surgery and radiation treatment. But just because radiation treatment is so uncommonly used, I've decided to leave that out of uh, today's uh, talk. So let's get right into it. Let's start with the uh, somatidin analog therapy. So very well tolerated, but certainly not free of side effects. So the common somatidin analogs we use in the clinic would be octreotide and lanreotide. And these really truly are the uh, workhorse in the NET clinic, at least for well-differentiated neuron tumors with uh, expression of somatidin receptors especially if these are functional tumors. Exceptionally safe drugs, even if you use them for prolonged time in terms of long-term serious complications, uh, they are really, really safe, but certainly not free of side effects. And these side effects are typically reversible. So once you stop uh, the drug, the side effects uh, go away and uh, they can be treated uh, adequately by using supportive medications. I'll go into that a little bit or by reducing the dose or if needed, which is not very common, just by discontinuing or stopping the treatment. So let's uh, introduce you to the pancreas. So, and because that's uh, the organ that probably is most often affected sort of clinically. So the pancreas has a lot of different jobs. But uh, the jobs that we interrupt with somatidin analog therapy are uh, the production and the release of digestive enzymes. So when we eat, the pancreas pumps out these digestive enzymes that help us digest the food. And then it makes insulin. And the insulin, of course, is uh, uh, critical in adjusting or managing the, the blood sugars. So first, with uh, the digestive system in general. So the somatidin analogs have very complex uh, uh, effects on the digestive system. We don't have time to go into all of that. But for this uh, uh, talk, uh, what we will be talking about is uh, the uh, ability of the SSAs to decrease uh, the ability of the pancreas to release digestive enzymes. So normally when you and I eat, uh, the pancreas senses that and it squirts out these digestive enzymes that help us break down the food, the fat, the protein, and carbohydrates. Um, and if you don't do, uh, uh, if you don't release in enough of these enzymes, then you won't be digesting your food properly. And what we're most uh, interested in, at least in this context, is the ability to digest fat. So if you can't digest fat, you will have a condition called steatorrhea, which essentially means fat in your stools. So this is because of undigested, uh, increased amounts of undigested fat in the stools. So you can have bloating, cramping, flatulence, light-colored, greasy, loose, and often very malodorous uh, stools uh, that often float in the toilet bowl. I'm sorry for being so graphic, but this is due to what it, what it is. And uh, there might be an oil slick on the water in the, in the toilet bowl. And this is something that the patients are often very sort of distraught by, and uh, th th this may affect other family members and co-workers, and this is just one of those things that patients don't really want to talk about. And if you let this go once you don't do anything about it, this can, in some cases, lead to uh, vitamin deficiencies over time, especially fat-soluble vitamins, but that will typically take some time, probably years. So how do we deal with this? How do we diagnose it and how do we manage it? So the key is to start by talking about it. And uh, this is probably the thing that people don't want to talk about in the clinic, but this is something that we neurotumor providers need to hear about. So in patients who are on a somatidin analog and have noticed these changes in their bowel habits after starting the SSAs, you may not need any testing. So you have the right patient on the right drug with the right symptoms. That's probably all you need to diagnose it. We don't have to go to any expensive testing. So you can try uh, treating it and see what happens. Sometimes there might be more than one uh, diarrhea going on, and that's where it might be good to get some testing done. But now we're just talking about something that started after you started the 
There's some of the analogs and sounds and uh, looks like steatria. So we can collect stool if we want uh, and measure fat over the course of two days on high fat diet, but that's a pretty unpleasant test for everyone involved. Or we can just go ahead and treat. So we can try over-the-counter digestive enzymes. It has to say enzymes on it, not probiotics. It has to be enzymes. Or we have to go to a prescription strength enzymes like Creon or Zentap or Biocase. Uh, those things are often needed. They tend to be sometimes expensive and not all insurance plans have a good coverage for those. But the key is that whatever it is, be it prescription strength enzyme or over-the-counter, you have to take this with the food. It has to go down with the food, mix in with, with the food, and help digest the food. If you take it an hour before or an hour later, it won't help. And then we may have to titrate or increase or even decrease the dose to sort of dial in on controlling the symptoms. And uh, some people may need a little bit of this and not with all meals. Others may need more and with most meals. So we sort of have to uh, try, uh, try a number of different things, figure out what works for that individual patient. So um, what about the other complications of somatidin analogs or SSAs? Well, they can cause gallstones, and they are actually quite common in patients on somatidin analog therapy and often asymptomatic. So, for example, there was a study from Italy that looked at a large group of uh, patients with uh, neurant tumors, and 27% of them developed system stones or gallstones, not necessarily always in the gallbladder, somewhere in the debilitary system. And among those 27 percent almost a third had complications from the gallstone so a gallstone getting stuck in a bile duct a gallstone causing pancreatitis or some other unpleasant things and we can really reduce the risk of complications by removing the gallbladder and that's why many surgeons elect to remove the gallbladder at the time of the cancer surgery and on the picture here to the right we can see uh, right in the middle there a thing that's filled with like little bright uh, things like a cluster of stars so these are small gallstones in the the in the gallbladder i don't think this patient was in an ssa for that just found a very illustrative picture well moving on so ssas can also affect your blood sugar so because indeed they they can decrease the production and release of insulin from the pancreas and it's actually pretty common so but we didn't really know how common this was so this year there was a study of more than 200 patients from england and 19 of these 200 patients developed a new type 2 diabetes after starting the drugs. Well, some of them might have developed that anyway. We can say type 2 diabetes is a pretty common condition. And of those who had type 2 diabetes going into the treatment, many of them actually had worse blood sugar control. So, and if we leave uh, blood sugar uncontrolled, high blood sugars, that over time can cause a number of problems. Usually it takes years. So kidney damage, neuropathy, and some other unpleasant uh, complications. And now that we're on the endocrine system, thyroid dysfunction, mostly th hypothyroidism or lazy thyroid, has been reported in patients on somatic analogs. But it's pretty uncommon. I've looked for it often, and usually I don't find it. So we can also target the somatidin receptor with PRT. So most of you are probably fairly familiar with PRT or peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. So essentially delivering a small charge of radiation directly to the tumor cells through the somatidin receptor. So PRT is truly a game changer in uh, neuron tumor therapy. So we didn't really have effective therapy for patients who had progressive tumors and somatidin analogs. And then we got PRT, and it really has changed things. So complete responses, as you may know, are fairly uncommon. I'd say pretty rare. I have seen one or two in my career. But many patients have what we call partial responses, where there's a little bit of shrinkage. And others will have stable disease for a long time. And that long time can sometimes be years. And there are some data recently that have suggested that patients may even live in excess of 10 years uh, if they receive PRT at some course in their illness. So if a patient is expected to live that long, obviously you will have more time to develop side effects. So that's why it becomes really important to talk about the risk. 
So I inform all of my patients about the risks of PRT, uh, about the other treatments that we could use instead. And then we have to make sort of an informed decision whether a PRT is something we would like to pro proceed with at this point in time or find some other treatments. But I will say that among the treatments we have after progression on somatized analogs, there is really nothing that's more effective than PRT, at least not at the current time. So the PRT will, it's radioactive, so it's given IV, so it goes everywhere. So this will affect your bone marrow. And in most patients, this radiation exposure to the bone marrow is pretty minimal and nothing really comes of it. So little clinical consequence. Sometimes there is some lowering of the blood counts, especially the platelets and the white blood cells, but sometimes also of the red blood cells or the hemoglobin. But that typically recovers over time, but sometimes we actually have to stop the PRRT prematurely. There have been patients I've had where we wanted to give uh, four cycles of PRRT, but we were only able to give three because the blood counts were just too low and it took a long time to, for them to come up. Despite the, the low blood counts, bleeding and uh, infections are fortunately, I'd like to say, or thankfully, very rare. So what about the really severe complications? They do exist. So a PRT can cause leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, or a condition called mild dysplastic syndrome, or MDS. So MDS is not really leukemia, but often quickly turns into leukemia. And it's not quite as severe and life-threatening as acute leukemia is, but it com comes pretty close. So this may happen in up to 2 to 3% of patients who are treated with PRT. But if you sort of look at that the other way, so of every 100 patients treated, less than three will develop leukemia or MDS, or 97% of those 100 uh, patients will not get leukemia. So we have to look at the, the bright side as well. So the risk may be increased in patients who received chemotherapy or radiation therapy in the past for the neuron, neuron tumors or for other uh, cancers. And there's really no good way of predicting this. And once it happens, life expectancy is short and the current treatments are very ineffective. But we're getting some promising drugs that may help some patients in this condition. So uh, moving on to other uh, complications of PRT. So uh, most of them are reversible and transient. There can be, uh, their bowel obstruction has been reported and uh, often is transient. Some bone worsening of bone pain in patients with, uh, with a lot of bone pain and some uh, disturbance of the immune system, the pituitary gland function, typically nothing that lasts for a long time. So move on to targeted therapy. Well, the interesting thing about targeted therapy, is it's actually not that targeted. We call it targeted therapy, but it actually hits a lot of normal tissue as well. So we have three different types. So the kinase inhibitors are probably among the uh, the more commonly used targeted therapy. Inherent tumors, so these, this is a family of drugs that uh, targets the different components of the very complex cancer cell machinery, but they're thought to affect the blood flow uh, more than anything else. And here we have some examples, sunetinib, cabozetinib, surfatinib, lenvatinib, axetinib, and there are some others. These are the IPs, uh, end with an IP. So the side effects tend to be transient and manageable, but can be pretty severe. And we often have to reduce the doses or sometimes even stop the drug. I would say uh, hypertension or high blood pressure is probably one of the more common side effects. And uh, this can occasionally result in severe complications like strokes, uh, heart attacks, and even bleeding into the brain. So we have to be really careful with this and monitor and treat very aggressively. Lots of other side effects, skin uh, toxicity like hand foot syndrome, like red and tender hands and feet, fatigue, diarrhea, and some other things. But by and large, uh, if you follow patients very carefully and if you address these side effects uh, early on, most patients are able to stay on these drugs, but sometimes at a lower dose. So the next one is from the family of mTOR inhibitors. That's really only Everolimus. There are some other mTOR inhibitors that we have, but Everolimus is the only one approved for neuron tumors. And it actually works for a lot of them, for the lung neuron tumors, for pancreatic neuron tumors, and for small bowel neuron tumors that are not associated with the carcinoid syndrome. As with the kinase inhibitors, there are definitely multiple side effects and mouth sores uh, that typically respond to dose reduction, or sometimes we have to use a steroid mouthwash. These can raise the blood sugars, especially if given with somatidin analogs, raise the triglycerides, 
which can in rare cases cause uh, problems like pancreatitis and then there are some other uh, less side effects like skin rash and infection. But as with the kinase inhibitor, most patients can actually stay on this uh, with some dose uh, modifications or adjustments. Sometimes you have to stop for a little bit and get started again at a lower dose. Immunotherapy is uh, kind of a targeted therapy, but um, not really. So, so the immune checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapy or ICIs, these are drugs that release the natural breaks of the immune system. So the immune system is held in check by uh, these, what are called natural breaks, because otherwise it would just run amok and attack uh, pretty much everything it saw in the body. And that would be called an autoimmune disease. So these drugs, they make the immune system more aggressive. They rev it up. And now the revved up immune system is ready to go find and kill cancer cells. But unfortunately, it can also kill some normal cells in the body. So immunotherapy is mostly used for poorly differentiated neuron carcinomas and not so much for neuron tumors where it doesn't really work that well. But this revved up immune system can start attacking normal cells in the body and such as the skin, the thyroid, lungs, digestive tract. So these are all things that we have to look out for very carefully and treat very, very aggressively. But this can really happen to any, any of the organ in the body. So uh, these would be called autoimmune complications. They can be anything from mild skin rash that maybe only needs uh, a moisturizing cream or a little bit of uh, steroids cream to very devastating inflammation of the heart and the nervous system and even occasionally to deaths. So if you compare immunotherapy to chemo in general, it tends to have milder side effects, but when they happen, they can be really, really severe. But thankfully, that is not that common. So be very vigilant if you're on immunotherapy, any new symptoms, ask your provider. There are no dumb questions when you're on immunotherapy. So if there's a new symptom you're worried about, you ask. And it's so uh, critical if uh, there are complications to intervene early, use therapy as needed with steroids or whatnot. So chemotherapy, we don't use a whole lot for pancreatic or for, for neuron tumors in general, except for pancreatic and lung. That's where we use cape and temozole, or through cape -tem. cape -tem is actually exceptionally safe. It can lower your blood counts and occasionally result in infections, but it's a really, really safe chemotherapy. Other chemotherapies, especially those that have oxaliplatin, like Folfox and K-box, these can cause a debilitating neuropathy over time. And this is the oxaliplatin that does that. Nerve damage that results in numbness and tingling and uh, that may not, even, may not even get better if you stop it. There's a low risk of chemotherapy causing leukemia. And for most patients with high-grade nerve carcinoma, that is not of any uh, concern because, well, we're dealing with a very lethal, aggressive malignancy and we just have to use chemotherapy. So this is still the cornerstone for poorly differentiated neuronal carcinoma therapy. So lastly, I just wanted to mention surgery, although I'm not a surgeon, I'm a medical oncologist, I have to deal with a lot of consequences of surgery. So if you remove uh, a piece of the small bowel, you can have some complications from that. Now you may not absorb vitamins as you did before. You can run into B12 deficiency. I actually saw that today in the clinic. Someone who had the small bowel resection a few years ago and now has vitamin B12 deficiency. Other vitamins, especially if there are long segments of the small bowel, and then we have uh, what's called bile acid diarrhea. So if you've removed a big chunk or even a small portion of the small bowel, especially towards the far end uh, as you get closer to the colon, what's called the ileum, you may no longer absorb bile acids or bile coming from the liver. And now the bile ends up in the colon where it works as a powerful laxative. So you can have diarrhea often with urgency and occasionally incontinence. And just before I came on this uh, presentation here, uh, I actually saw a patient today in a video consultation who has classic bile acid diarrhea. And you can treat this with what's called bile acid binding drugs like cholesterol and cholesterol. And then with uh, major pancreatic resections, you can also get pancreatic exocrine insufficiency as you would get with somatidin analog therapy with steatorrhea. So just to summarize this, so side effects of uh, neck therapy are common, but uh, generally reversible and often mild. So they can be managed with supportive measures and sometimes dose reduction or even occasionally by stopping the drug. So cumulative side effects that sort of build up over time thankfully are not that common. And the different drug classes, different types of therapy have their different sort of unique uh, side effects. So you really need to know what the patient is on when they present uh, with uh, these symptoms. 
But the most concerning side effect from a therapy is the treatment related myeloid neoplasm, or the acute leukemia, or the NDS from PRT. But thankfully, this is fairly uncommon. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Again, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. Thank you. You may have read your pathology reports, which are so important to know your nets, but do you really understand them? We now welcome University of Chicago Medicine's Dr. Namrata Sedia, Associate Professor in the Department of Pathology. Dr. Sedia has some tips on how to read your pathology reports. Hi, I'm Namrita Setia. I'm a pathologist at University of Chicago. Pathologists are medical doctors who look at slides under the microscope to make diagnoses. And I um, have a special interest in neuroendocrine tumors, that's why I'm here today. I should thank Dr. Uh, Liao and Dr. Quicken for uh, setting up this uh, FaceTime with all of you because my work is incomplete without you. And also thank the Endocrine Tumor Research Foundation. In the next 15 minutes or so, my job is to make sense of this daunting document, which is the pathology report. And I hope that I'll be able to answer most of your questions without even the Q&A session. So, but let's just begin. So as a pathologist, I may receive neuroendocrine tumors in two forms or ways. I may have received a resection specimen or a biopsy specimen. Resection specimens is often to sort of uh, treat the tumor and biopsy specimens are more for um, diagnosing the tumors. The resection specimens come from Dr. Quicken, but the biopsy specimens often will come from our radiology colleagues. And as far as uh, when you are looking at a report, if the report is, say, three pages long, it's a resection report, whereas if it's like one or two pages long, it's a biopsy report. So let's start with a long report, the three-page one. And you'll see by the end of it that the three-page one and the one or two-page one are very similar. So the top post portion here in the report, which is highlighted by the very dark blue box and then uh, expanded in a bigger version in the black box over there, is what connects the specimen to you and our system. So on the left side of the screen is your information, the name, your medical record number, the date of birth, age, gender, the surgeon who took the specimen out, and the physician who needs a copy of the report and is part of the care team, say Dr. Liao, who needs to know what to do next. Then we have other information when the specimen was collected. And then most importantly, on the right side, we have an accession number. This is the number in our system. This is the number that we give to the specimen. So if you ever have to request the slides or the blocks, you need to reference this number. Now, every hospital has its own way of writing this number. At University of Chicago, we use an S number, S for surgical pathology, followed by the year 22, mean, meaning that the, the specimen was obtained or received in the year 2022. And then this is going to be followed by a unique numeric number, which is sequential and is given to that specimen. So every time you have to refer the specimen in for a pathology department, kind of have to look for that accession number. So with the number, there will be slides and blocks that can be requested. This information is generated in the gross room. And contrary to what the name sounds like, gross room, that it's actually anything but gross. As you can see, it's a team of very helpful, diligent, and lovely people, and their job is to make sure that there are no errors, errors like specimen mix-up. And they take their job very, very seriously, and we are very thankful for their efforts to make sure that there are no specimen mix-up errors. Underneath that is a final diagnosis. This is the bottom line, the most essential information, that one sentence or two sentences will have summary of the most important information that needs to be drawn from the report. And let me just highlight the main points. So for these kind of specimens, you would often see the report as listed as well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. And the good news here is that it's a tumor and not carcinoma. Why I say that is because tumors are different from carcinomas. So even in carcinomas or cancers, as we colloquially call them, 
they come in different levels of aggressiveness. Pancreatic cancer is notorious for being very you know, aggressive, and the five-year survival rate for that is about 7%. Compared to that, the small intestinal cancers or carcinomas, the five-year survival rate is about 50%. And the good news here is that neuroendocrine tumors, especially the GI neuroendocrine tumors, the five-year survival rate is 90, about 95%. So I'm not uh, trying to say that these are not important and you need to just not care about them. But the important thing here is that you especially need a specialized care team like at University of Chicago because it almost ends up being like a chronic disease. So the next point that I want to draw your attention to that is there in the final diagnosis is the site. As you can see, it's written in the final diagnosis as ileal. Ileum is a part of small intestine that's also jotted down in the synoptic point by point report right underneath the final diagnosis. And why the site is important is of course for the management because that part of the body might need to be resected, but also Based on the site, the tumor may be secreting certain type of biologic substances that may actually be the reason for the clinical presentation. Also, the tumors at different sites, even for the same stage, may behave very differently. As you can see, the small intestinal tumor, which is local, will behave very differently from an appendiceal localized neuroendocrine tumor, which is going to be very different from a liver primary neuroendocrine tumor. So the point I want to make here is that the same stage tumors might behave differently based on the site. And this is the information that Dr. Quicken and Dr. Liao are going to use to determine what needs to be done in terms of the management. And that's why we list it in the final diagnosis. The next point that I want to draw your attention to is the grade. So the grade is listed again at two different places. In the final diagnosis where you see that this tumor is intermediate grade and then in, again in the point by point synoptic diagnosis which is listed below which kind of talks about how this grade was calculated. Since grade is very important let me just talk about it a little bit more. So it can be calculated in two different ways. One is a mitotic count and mitotic count is just determined by looking at the slide as we have it and we just basically count the number of cells that are dividing. To determine the key 67 proliferative index we have to do another kind of special stain and what this stain does is it doesn't just pick up the cells that are dividing right now but also picks up the cells that are almost ready to divide. So it gives a more sensitive indicator of the tumor being aggressive or not. And then we combine the information together to give you a final grade and the grades can be three types, grade one, two, and three, which is low, intermediate, and high. Of course, corresponding to least aggressive to most aggressive. And again, this information is going to be used by Dr. Quicken and Dr. Liao to determine how aggressively they need to treat the tumor. So as you can see, even at the same site, say for small intestine, the dark green box is grade one tumor and the lighter, lightest box is grade two and in the intermediate color is grade three and grade three are going to behave much worse. So they need to be treated most aggressively. So the grade is a very important part of the final uh, report or final diagnosis. If you do not see a grade in your report, you should be asking your doctor that that information needs to be provided. After the grade, then we come to the synoptic report, basically the points in the synoptic report. And we covered the top part, the points that are listed below. You don't need to go through them because what we do is we, we jot them together to come up with the T, N, and M stage. And that T, N, and M stage basically decides what the clinical stage is going to be. And the place where the T, N, and M are listed are at the bottom of the report in the University of Pathology System, but then it could be University of Chicago Pathology System, and it could be different at other institutions. But um, this is where you would find the T, N, or M stage in, in our report. But and for determining these stages is we assess T and NM separately. T is basically the tumor stage, which means how aggressively at the local site the tumor is spreading. 
in terms of small bowel it's going to be depth in terms of liver it's going to be how extensive or pancreas that means it's it's the size so it's either going to be depth based or size based so that's the t stage the end stages the regional nodes that are draining the tumor the ones that are shown in yellow are how many of them are involved by tumor and the m stage basically is beyond local like now the tumor has gone places now which places are involved and how far are they in terms of biology is what determines the m stage and then we put all of them together to determine the clinical stage so different combinations of t and m will give a clinical stage of one through four with one being the lowest four being the highest of course as expected four will be most aggressive and that needs to be treated most aggressive as well. So that information is very valuable in terms of clinical management. So you see the black line, dark black line. So that basically ends the clinical report. Underneath that, we have several other things listed. The biggest paragraph is for the gross description. And that's basically more of a pathologist cross crosstalk. So you say you decide to go to another institute, say MD Anderson or MSK, and now they want to read the uh, look at the slides, but the specimen is no longer there. So they need to figure out what slide means what. So, for example, this specimen was 41 centimeters. You cannot look for at 41 centimeters under the microscope. So you need to take selective sections from those 41 centimeters to which are representative of the tumor. And that's what the gross description is. So this is not meant for the patients. This is more for another pathologist and sometimes for the surgeons. But I think you could just leave that to Dr. Liao and Dr. Quicken or to the other pathology institution wherever the specimen goes to. So really that's just showing when we opened up the specimen, it's the rest of it is fine and they're just these small tumor nodules and we recorded what it looked like. But that is more for the, the three page report. Now, coming on to the biopsy report, which is for GI neuroendocrine tumors, it's mostly from the liver, as is this report, because liver is a very common site of metastasis in these tumors, as is seen in this case. So you see the beginning is metastatic, but it's still tumor. It's not carcinoma, it's still tumor. So you'll see the same sort of information that was listed in, in the long report here as well. So it's well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. The grade is listed as, as grade two as intermediate grade. It's metastatic and that we have tried to determine what the site is because sometimes you end up with metastasis before you can know the, what the primary site is. So in this case, we think it's some, somewhere in the GI tract. So in some ways, the accession information is the same. The parts of the, the report are also quite similar, but it's just a smaller report just because right now the purpose is diagnosis and not that it, it, it's a point or a segue in, in the treatment. So we talked about the long report, we talked about the short report. Sometimes it helps to put all this in perspective once you know what the, the background context is. And that's why sometimes it's helpful to know what the journey of the specimen is. We already talked about how the specimen's first stop is the cutting or the growth room. And we talked about the, the very diligent people in the growth room who make sure that no mix-up errors happen. And then we also talked about how you have to open up because you cannot examine 41 centimeters under the microscope. So you need to take sections. And these sections are taken from people who have been trained, who have gone through special intensive training Either they're going to become pathologists or they're pathologist assistants who have gone through special school to make sure that they know what sections to take and the, the implications of uh, taking those sections. So that's what is done in the gross room. But before we can still look at the slides under the microscope, there is more processing that needs to be done and we don't need to get into the complexities of it, but that's done in the histology lab. So histology lab has this extensive workup where they sort of minimize the tissue into like five micron thin sections so that they can be looked at under the microscope by a pathologist who has been trained through rigorous training and fellowships to be able to recognize what a tumor looks like and how you need to best report the information coming up by just looking at the tumor or using special stains so that that can guide the treatment in the best manner. 
And then another type of report that I'm not going to get too much into the details of right now is a molecular report. And molecular report sort of gives more information than beyond just looking at it under the microscope. Now you're looking at it at a very cellular level in terms of like the genes and the, the copy number plots and, and methylation. And this provides opportunities for personalized therapy. And at this point, I want to thank Dr. Quiggin and Dr. Liao for their progressive approach because now we are doing next generation sequencing on all neuroendocrine tumors at University of Chicago. So I'm hoping that all this in, in future is going to lead, uh, lead to personalized therapy approaches for neuroendocrine tumors. And finally, I'm proud to say that while we are looking forward into the future, the University of Chicago is also excellent at preserving its past and history. We have archives dating back to 1912, so more than over 100 years back. So if we end up making discoveries for future, we have enough specimens that have been preserved so that we can validate our findings and which can be of use for, for personalized therapy in the future. I know this is a lot to take and I've listed my personal information. We also have Q&A session. If you have questions about your reports, please feel free to contact me either during the Q&A session or through the information listed here. I'll be more than happy to answer the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sedia. It is also important to understand the reports from your many scans. We welcome Dr. Sedia's colleague, Dr. Carla Harmath. Dr. Harmath is an associate professor of radiology and the section chief of abdominal radiology at the University of Chicago Medicine. She is going to educate us on what you need to know to understand your radiology reports. Hi everyone, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Carla Harmeth and I am a associate professor of abdominal radiology in Chicago at University of Chicago. I am the chief of abdominal radiology here, and I'm going to talk to you about how to read your radiology reports. Here are my credentials. So the overview of this lecture, we're going to start with a little introduction. We're going to talk about imaging in neuroendocrine tumors, what is best, and how to recognize a good report. The objectives are to familiarize with the different types of imaging getting power to have an open discussion with the physicians about which type of follow-up imaging to get and why, and to be able to get a basic comprehension of some radiology terms in order to understand your reports. So in the introduction, um, a lot of people don't know, but radiology is a medical specialty, and radiologists are physicians who interpret the imaging exams. They have a minimum of five years of specialty training or residency after medical school. Most radiologists in a tertiary care center or university center who have a more extensive training that is dedicated to a specific part of the body. This is obtained by doing a fellowship after those five years of residency, and these fellowships can be one, two years or more. So imaging in neuroendocrine tumor. Imaging is one of the most accepted ways of diagnosing and following up neuroendocrine tumors. The technologists are the professionals who obtain the images, and these technologists do have specific training in their modalities. For example, there are technologists who have specialties in magnetic resonance imaging, computer tomography, ultrasound, x-rays, fluoroscopy, and nuclear medicine. They are the ones who help us radiologists get, the, get your images so we can interpret them. So usually you get greeted and scanned by a technologist once you get to the radiology suite. And this is an example of a technologist scanning a patient. So when you arrive and you're getting your exam, the patient is greeted and seen by the technologist and nurses in radiology. Usually us, the radiologists, are going to stay hidden in this reading room near the scanner. So we are nearby to aid and help with any problems, but we're not directly seeing you as a patient. We're seeing your images. So we're in the background room, which have a lot of computers we call workstations, where we get the images and we interpret them. So this will be what I do, I sit there in front of all the images we get from you and I try to interpret them, uh, comparing them with others, give your doctor report and yourself a report. The types of imaging most commonly used for neuroendocrine tumors include computer tomography, a CT or CAT scan, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, and positron emission tomography or PET. 
what is the difference between those? So computer tomography does use radiation, which gets blocked or absorbed by different organs at a degree. So that's what allows us to see the differences between bone, fat, air, and other organs and tissues, for example. And this is an example of a CT machine for those of you who haven't seen one. These are the types of images we get a CT exam, and that's what I see when I uh, get the images on the, in the reading room. Magnetic resonance imaging is another modality which uses a strong magnetism to align the protons or the hydrogen molecules in our bodies. We then apply a radio frequency to shift them around, and when they are recovering or aligning back with the big magnet is when we get these. So since every organ or tissue have a different amount of protons, we get a different signal or shade of gray from different areas. And this is an MRI machine for those of you who haven't seen one. It's very similar to the CT, which you can see that donut or the bore is a little bit longer. And that's a big magnet. These are the types of images we obtain with MRI. And to some of you, they may look very similar to the CT scan exams, but to us radiologists, they're quite different. Positron emission tomography uses radio pharmaceuticals, which are substances with a radioactive component in them. They get injected in your vein. The most common and specific radio pharmaceutical for neuroendocrine tumors is the dotatate, which binds to the somatostatin receptors in neuroendocrine tumors. However, the most prevalent PET radio pharmaceutical that you may have heard of is FDG, which uses glucose bound with a radio pharmaceutical. So most tumors in general in life, they use glucose more than tissues do. That's how we see them using the FDG. In the case of neuroendocrine tumors, however, not all of them use a lot of glucose, and that's why other substances like the Dota tape were developed. And this is a PET scanner, and most of the times the PET scan is combined with a CT scan or MRI in order for us to localize where tumors are, and they you know, may have both exams at the same time. These are the images we get. So uh, the first one is a CT scan that we get together with the second one, which is a PET exam. And usually we fuse them at the end to try and localize the areas of activity or the areas of tumor. So what is best? Let's talk a little bit about the pluses and minuses of each modality. So CT exam is very fast. It costs less. It's more reproducible, meaning everywhere in the world you go, the images are very similar and it's less susceptible to motion. Let's say you're short of breath and you cannot hold still because of pain. A CT scan is obtained in a few or less than one minute, so that's less susceptible to motion. However, it does include radiation and contrast. MRI, on the other hand, is very sensitive to the different tissues, so it's easier for me, for example, to see a lesion in the liver compared to the liver parenchyma or normal liver itself. Different types of contrast can be used, so it can help differentiate and better quantify lesions, for example, and there's no radiation. However, it is less reproducible. Not everywhere in the world we have the same types of protocols for MRI and not every machine produces the same quality of imaging. It's more susceptible to motion because it takes a little longer to acquire. So if we move a little bit, the machine may not know exactly where the lesion was or the organ is and I get blurred images. And it's more expensive, also usually needs contrast. PET dotatate is very specific for neuroendocrine tumors and very reproducible. However, it does use radiation and usually we need a concomitant CT or MRI scan to locate the activity or where tumors are, and it's the most expensive of all. So what is the best imaging modality, right? It depends. For the initial imaging, when you're having pain and you want to find out what's going on, a CT exam is usually best because it's very fast. If you're a patient with symptoms and for emergencies, usually, again, CT exam is very fast and very reliable. MRI, however, is one of the best modalities for visualization and quantification of liver metastasis, and it's a key exam whenever we're planning resection or treatment of metastasis. A PET exam, on the other hand, is very sensitive and can help locate lesions that may not be visible in certain organs or diseases in lymph nodes that may otherwise look normal by other modalities. By CT and MR, for example, we use size to say if a node is abnormal most of the times, and PET can actually detect abnormality in very small nodes that if I look at an MR, I say, oh, it's probably normal. But if it's active on the PET, that does not mean it's normal. So basically, we should tailor the images to the needs of our patients. One important thing to realize is the imaging is just one component of your medical journey, and it does need to be interpreted in the context of every individual. For example, I see a lesion, it may be getting larger, but this could be because there's inflammation from a treatment response, like your body is reacting to it. Sometimes it's larger because the tumor is worse. Sometimes because there was a local treatment. 
So clinical input from your other treating doctors is very important for me as a radiologist to interpret what I see in an exam. Sometimes we can only differentiate between a treatment response or growth after a follow-up exam. So you may not know that radiologists may not have access to your exams if they're not done at the same institution. We keep a record of your exams at the same institution. However, if you have an exam done even at a institution, it does not mean we share the images and we can see each other's images. So it's very important for us to have previous images as diseases have an evolution pattern. And a finding in one exam may mean something very different if it's unchanged from prior or if it's a new finding. For example, in this case, I have a set of exams. The patient showed up with a tiny thing, and that arrow is pointing to a lesion in the liver. The second row of exams, it's a little larger. Third row, it got smaller, and then it kind of stayed the same. So in this case, I know the evolution, correct? However, if I only have this, I don't know if it's getting worse, if it's the same, if it's a new finding. If I only have this, oh, it's a stable disease or maybe getting a little bit better. If I have this, definitely getting worse. The lesions are larger. So that tells you how important it is for me to have, have a uh, distribution over time of how things are looking. Moving on to understanding your radiology reports. So most places we use a structured report to provide a radiology report. This is to make the report easier to read. Most templates, especially in the U.S., are pre-populated. They come with some basic language. At the University of Chicago, for example, specifically in abdominal imaging, our templates come pre-populated no significant abnormality noted, as some of you who have imaging with us may notice. And you should know also that radiologists have a different level of sensitivity on what to include as a significant finding and what to leave out as a non-important finding. I'm showing here an example of our template. So if you see, um, you know, I have lung bases there, no significant abnormality, and that comes up. However, if I'm looking at your exam and I find something abnormal, I'll replace that by there's a nodule in the lung base or there is an opacity that may represent pneumonia and so on. So understanding your report, the first step, you have to know which modality was used, CT, MRI, PET, and then is there contrast or not? So what is contrast? It's a substance that we use to try and differentiate away organs, vessels, and abnormality look in computer tomography and magnetic resonance imaging. So you see the first imaging where the black arrow is. I mean, that's again in the liver. I don't see much in the first image. That's a null contrast image. The second image, however, is a consim. And you can see that that area, the arrow is pointing to an area there's a little bit less bright or you know darker than the parenchyma. So I know there's a lesion there and I know I need to address that. In addition to contrast, MRI also uses what we call different sequences in which organs, fluid, and other structures will have a different appearance. And this is why MR takes so much longer, right? Because every single one of these images that I'm showing is a different sequence and also at a different time. So every one of those is obtained for the entire abdomen at one point. So that's why you may sit in the machine for 20 minutes to half an hour or more. So both CT and MR can use different contrasts, oral and intravenous. The oral contrast can help the radiology differentiate bowel from masses and may not be always needed. The intravenous contrast helps to see lesions and abnormalities, the detailed anatomy, vessels, and differentiate those normal structures in the organs from the organs itself, themselves. PET will use radiopharmaceuticals intravenously. Intravenous contrast for CT is most commonly iodide-based, and intravenous contrast for MRI is most commonly gadolinium-based. Of that, there are two main subtypes. One of it is much more vascular, and the other one also goes into the hepatic or liver cells. The latter is called hepatobiliary agent, and it's commonly used to look for neuroendocrine tumor metastasis in the liver. So your doctor may order a specific MRI with hepatobiliary agent uh, to evaluate metastatic neuroendocrine tumor to the liver. And why all that? Why all this contrast? And this is how the radiologist can differentiate a normal tissue, benign, indeterminate, and malignant lesion. The contrast, the different timing in which we image the contrast in the body, as well as the different sequences in MRI, for example, will help me recognize lesions and try to describe them and uh, let you know what they are. Certain lesions have very specific descriptors that can be very specific. And I can really say, okay, this is a hepatocellular carcinoma, for example, or this is a benign hemangioma. Other lesions do not. But that's why I need all this, to try my best and be able to classify the lesion and help you out. In order to understand your report, you have to 
know a little bit of those weird terms that we use. So the radiology report will include some specific radiology terms as well as terms related to the modality used. For example, in CT, common descriptors include density, which is the tone of gray or the attenuation of gray, attenuation of X-rays, the enhancement, the amount of contrast that goes into an organ or into a lesion. And that enhancement is uh, timed in arterial, mostly in the arteries, venous, mostly in the veins, or delayed after it's kind of washed out from both. And these are among other descriptors that we use. MRI, some descriptors include signal intensity, enhancement, which is also the same thing as CT, the arterial enhancement, early, venous, or delayed. But also, it will include how things look on those different sequences that I told you, which are labeled T1, T2, diffusion, and so on. Those names are a little uh, different, but that's how we recognize lesions and how they behave. Terms that are used in PET include active, metabolically active, uptake, or SUV, which is standard uptake value. And a PET exam will be usually combined with a CT or MR to better locate the area of activity. So why so many words? Why can't we just say the tumor is worse? There's a lesion that is not a tumor or there is an infection. Medical language is needed in order for doctors to have a more profound understanding of what's happening. And we need to be on the same page. However, we as physicians should be able to explain what the overall meaning is in easy terms for patients whenever needed. So how to read your report? The body of the report will have usually descriptors to justify the impression we're going to have at the end. So there should be an impression at the end or a conclusion on every radiology report that should summarize the overall findings and what they mean. Sometimes it can be very objective. Sometimes I can really say what it is specifically because of the characteristics. Sometimes it needs to include possibilities, a lesion that is not very specific, could be this, this, or that. And sometimes, you know, I have to say, I don't know what it is. We need further imaging or we may need a biopsy. So this is the reason why it's important for us radiologists and your doctors to work as a team and with you so we can interpret the imaging findings in the context of your own clinical finding. How to recognize a good report. In my thought, a good radiology report should have a balance of detail, description, or objectivity. The radiologist should be able to provide a conclusion stating if the findings favor a benign process, a malignant process, infection or inflammation, progression, or improvement of disease process. When a more concrete diagnosis cannot be made, there should be a guidance on what next step will be helpful, like I would recommend an MR or I recommend a uh, PET exam, for example. The radiologist should also be available to discuss the report with the ordering physician. So good radiology service, you know, will have your radiology physician available to your other physicians to be able to go over your findings and come up to a conclusion again in that context of your clinic history. Uh, many of you may ask, should I go to a general radiology place or a specialized place? Does it really matter? Does it make any difference? So I think it will depend on what you're looking for. Most radiologists are able to recognize basic disease. Everyone that goes under a five-year residency training should be able to recognize basic things. But one thing to remember is that a general radiologist has to know a little bit about everything. They have to know neuro, they have to know abdominal imaging, musculoskeletal imaging. In my case, as a subspecialty radiology, I'm able to have a more knowledge of very specific disease patterns. So sometimes that can be more helpful, it's like you know, having a uh, general contractor or a you know, handyman versus a plumber. So in summary, Make sure you're getting the exam that is adequate for your symptoms or disease. Your doctors, including the radiologists at the institution you seek treatment, should be able to guide you. Exams to follow up neuroendocrine tumors should be performed with intravenous contrast whenever possible. We may not be able to see tumors or metastasis without it. A good radiology report should use a comparison whenever available. A good radiology report should have descriptors of the findings. And it's best if the radiology report is objective, that gives an answer or guidance on what to do next. It needs to add value to your treatment, and it needs to help you and the treating physicians navigate this journey. With that, I thank you, and I'll be available to answer any questions, and you can email me if you have any uh, questions or concerns. Our final talk today is from Dr. David Richards, a gastroenterologist in the Department of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Richards will talk about the challenges of managing gastrointestinal troubles, diet, and diarrhea when you have nets. After Dr. Richards' presentation, stay tuned for our live question and answer session. Mm.
Hi everyone, I'm Dave Richards. I'm a gastroenterologist at MD Anderson Cancer Center and I was asked to talk to you today about GI symptoms and neuroendocrine tumors. I'm not going to get into all the details, things you guys probably already know. Neuroendocrine cells though are present throughout the lungs, the GI tract, the pancreas, and they're the largest group of hormone producing cells in the body. They're derived from local tissue specific stem cells and they have endodermal origins. And Tumors of these cells can produce a variety of symptoms. Many of them depend on where the tumors are located and the types of hormones that they're producing. So here's a really busy chart that shows you several different hormones that are produced. Many of these are from pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but also you'll notice at the bottom serotonin, which comes from carcinoid tumors uh, throughout the GI tract and other locations. You also see norepinephrine, epinephrine produced by pheochromocytoma is also sort of in this group of tumors. But the point is not to get too bogged down in the different hormones, but rather just to know that the types of symptoms and things that we see are related to the hormones that the tumors are producing as well as where the tumors are located. So again, just a little bit of background just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, neuroendocrine tumors can show up in the stomach. Gastric neuroendocrine tumors come in a three different types, but really only type three can lead to carcinoid syndrome. Small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors are probably the most common malignancy of the small intestine, accounting for 41% of small intestinal tumors. Their incidence has been increasing and 90% of them are found in the very bottom portion of the small bowel, the ileum. Small intestinal tumor secretions are plentiful. Over 40 substances have been identified, but the things that we think of as typical carcinoids secrete serotonin, and this gets excreted out in the urine as a metabolite called 5-HIAA. Atypical carcinoids lack the enzyme DOPA decarboxylase, so they don't secrete 5-HT or serotonin. The clinical features that we see, again, involve what they may be secreting, but also where they're located. So some can present as bowel obstructions, others can affect blood flow and cause things like ischemia, which is low blood flow to an area and damage that area from that lack of blood flow. So people have pain or bleeding. Intussusception is a telescoping of the bowel, GI bleeding, of course. Sometimes people get enlargement of the liver and that can cause pain in the right upper part of their abdomen or have abnormalities of their liver enzymes. And then carcinoid syndrome, which we're gonna talk about, as well as sometimes if the tumors are located in the connective tissue from the small intestine, you can get some other symptoms from blockage of that where people can have partial bowel obstructions or just cramping type abdominal pain. I think it's interesting to notice though that the most common symptom reported is a prolonged non-specific abdominal pain, which is hard to pick these things out from other things that cause pains. Quick word on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Again, these can produce a variety of different hormones and excess of all these hormones can cause different clinical symptoms and syndromes. Functional tumors are the ones that secrete these hormones and cause clinical syndromes, but a lot of them are non-functional and they don't have any clinical syndromes associated with them. They may have some stored hormones in them, but they don't secrete them out. And they might secrete uh, substances that don't really cause any problems. So to get into the carcinoid syndrome, you need a sufficient amount of serotonin circulating around to get symptoms. It's pretty rare in certain gastric neuroendocrine tumors, like we talked about already, type three gastrocarcinoids are probably the only ones. If you look at all the patients at the time they're diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor, about 19% or one in five of them will have symptoms of carcinoid syndrome at diagnosis. But this ranges and it varies based on where the neuroendocrine tumors are. So 8% in lung neuroendocrine tumors, all the way up to 32% in small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors. And the carcinoid syndrome is associated with advanced disease. Survival is not as good for patients who present with carcinoid syndrome. But the good news is that somatostatin analogs are associated with major improvements in flushing and diarrhea in about 75% of patients. Somatostatin analogs should be tried regardless of the somatostatin receptor imaging results. What are the features of carcinoid syndrome? Well, there's a, several different key features, flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, or asthma. Not everybody will have every feature, but many people will have several of them. Diarrhea tends to be intermittent, but it can come in explosive episodes, and the diarrhea is usually watery. Fatty diarrhea from carcinoid syndrome, or what we call steatorrhea, is pretty rare. Abdominal cramps show up about half the time, and a large liver in about two-thirds of patients. 
And this uh, condition called pellagra can come up. This is because the neuroendocrine tumors use tryptophan to make serotonin. And by taking all the tryptophan to make serotonin, then they decrease the conversion of tryptophan into nicotinic acid, which is a form of niacin. Features of pellagra include rashes in sun-exposed areas, a red tongue, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, dementia, delusions, anxiety, different uh, neurologic dysfunctions. So what can we do about this? Thankfully, uh, nowadays we have several somatostatin analogs, and these are the first line in the management of functional and non-functional neuroendocrine tumors. There's two big ones that we use, lanreotide and octreotide LAR, and these are both long-acting forms of a somatostatin. The uh, immediate form of octreotide is used for some breakthrough symptoms. Somatostatin analogs have all the biologic action of somatostatin, and this leads to suppression of gastrointestinal tract and pancreatic functions. This is why they help with the diarrhea, for example. But because of these uh, effects, you can have other uh, consequences like fat maldigestion and alterations in the absorption of fat or fat-soluble vitamins. So even these medications that are used to control some of the symptoms can have some symptoms themselves like fatty diarrhea or steatorrhea, gas production, uh, nonspecific abdominal discomforts, high blood sugar, low thyroid function. So we mo uh, monitor periodically people's sugar metabolism, thyroid function, vitamin D, B12 when they're on these medications. What do we do if people are refractory to these somatostatin analogs? Well, we can use nonspecific stuff like antidiarrheal drugs, uh, loperamide, and diphenoxylatropine, better known as Imodium and Lamotil. Uh, these are probably better avoided if you're not sure if there's a bowel obstruction or if you have fever, bloody diarrhea, there's concern for infection or undiagnosed inflammatory bowel disease. These agents really just slow down the GI tract. The other things that's been used for people who are refractory to somatostatin analogs is debulking of the tumors with liver-directed therapies, whether it's by interventional radiologists or surgeons. We can increase the dose of the somatostatin analog or shorten the interval. So most of the time they're given every four weeks. Maybe we need to give them more frequently than that. Years ago, they were using low-dose interferon, although this has really fallen off the algorithm. And we can rotate the somatostatin analogs. If people are still not responding to these and there's still refractory carcinoid syndrome symptoms, we need to think about other things that cause these symptoms, particularly like diarrhea. For example, Peak pill can get pancreatic insufficiency from the somatostatin analog itself. You might have shortcut syndrome related to bile resections or issues with the absorption of bile salts or loss of bile salts. Maybe there's some other infection going on or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or some other condition that needs to be diagnosed. Pancreatic enzyme insufficiency can be an issue, particularly with somatostatin analog use. Checking a fecal elastase or checking the stool for a pancreatic enzyme called elastase can be helpful, although sometimes it's misleading because profuse diarrhea can make your fecal elastase low anyways. The consideration for pancreatic enzyme insufficiency should be considered only when there's fatty diarrhea. And if that's the case, some guidelines have suggested trials of pancreas enzymes to see if it helps with fat uh, absorption. Ileal resections are common in patients with uh, ileal neuroendocrine tumors and other bowel surgeries. If there's a small portion of the ileum that's resected, then usually the liver just increases bile production to account for the loss. But a lot of bile acids wind up getting all the way to the colon. They can cause issues with water absorption and increased secretions, and this can lead to diarrhea itself. We use bile acid binders like cholestyramine or Wellcol to try to soak up these uh, bile acids before they get to the colon and cause problems. If there's really large portions of the distal small intestine or the ileum removed, then we can, might have issues with keeping up with bile acid loss. So sometimes this includes resections that uh, involve the ileocecal valve, but the bile pool is depleted during the day and this leads to fat malabsorption. It can be pretty difficult to treat. Sometimes we try adding bile acids or glutamine or growth factors, but it's not always easy to deal with. You know, people don't love collecting their stool, but Thankfully, we have some uh, better tests nowadays to look for this. We can collect a two-day stool collection and measure how many bile acids are there. It's important to note that if we're going to do this kind of uh, stool testing, that we have to have enough fat in the stool during the day to get an accurate collection. So patients on a really low-fat diet might get weird results. Again, we can use bile acid binding agents to help with this bile acid malabsorption issue. 
there's a lot of infections people get. It's important to think about these, especially if people have had antibiotics or been in the hospital, for example, and we should be considering things like Clostridium difficile. But checking for other infections is important too, especially if things uh, aren't responding to the usual course of treatment. Testing the stool can be really helpful for this kind of stuff. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, this is common in a lot of patients that have had previous surgeries or are exposed to different medications like antibiotics. This is where bacteria from the colon, uh, where bacteria normally live, have creeped up into the small intestine where they don't belong. And their presence in excessive numbers can cause all kinds of symptoms, particularly things like bloating and diarrhea. We can treat this with antibiotics, uh, and sometimes we tailor this to the type of uh, organisms we find. Breath testing can be really helpful, and here's an example of a breath test where patients are asked to breathe into these bags every uh, 20 minutes, and we collect and measure the hydrogen and methane content. We can also look for other malabsorption issues like sucrose or fructose malabsorption. Lactose intolerance, which involves lactose malabsorption, is probably the most common one and the thing people are most familiar with. Telotrostat is a, a very new drug that um, some people feel is really, really helpful in patients that have refractory carcinoid syndrome uh, symptoms. It's been studied in patients with carcinoid syndrome who have at least four bowel movements a day. There's a potential role in patients with stable radiographic disease and refractory carcinoid syndrome uh, symptoms, with sub, particularly with suboptimal control of diarrhea. Some guidelines have suggested that in this setting, it could be the drug of choice. As we talked about before, pancreatic neuronic tumors can produce other symptoms, so sometimes we use other drugs. Things like gastrinomas that are producing high amounts of gastrin lead to big increases in uh, stomach acid output. So we use things that block stomach acid like proton pump inhibitors, things you might be familiar with like omeprazole uh, or pantoprazole to block acid uh, coming out of the stomach. And again, you'll see a theme where we're using long-acting octreotide for many of these things. You're also seeing that refractory peanut symptoms, we might use uh, nonspecific antidiarrheal agents or liver-directed therapy like we talked about for other neuroendocrine tumors. What can we do if uh, second-line therapy for treating tumors and mats? Well, there's all kinds of tumor-directed therapy, surgical debulking, hepatic arterial, arterial embolization, and targeted things using um, uh, uh, dotatate uh, tag to uh, treatment. But uh, these are better talked about by the oncologists who use these things more commonly. But just know that directing uh, therapy to uh, patients, particularly who have liver predominant disease and suboptimal carcinoid syndrome control, uh, can really help with reducing the symptoms. What about diet therapy? This is always something that I want to know more about. Patients who are newly diagnosed with neuronal tumors who don't have symptoms should follow a healthy diet based on current USDA recommendations. Patients who are symptomatic from carcinoid syndrome uh, may do well to follow a couple of uh, rules of thumb. Avoiding spicy foods or um, alcohol may help to prevent flushing or even diarrhea. Things like pepper, cayenne pepper, mustards, those are often offending agents. There's also common trigger foods when these uh, patients with neuroendocrine tumors have been surveyed. Things like tomato dishes, chocolate, nuts, raw veggies, these can also trigger diarrhea and other symptoms. For select patients, uh, avoiding high amine-containing foods can be really helpful. Uh, avoiding high fat foods can be helpful in avoiding caffeine as well as large meals. We'll get into the amine-containing foods a little more in a couple of slides. It's always important to stay hydrated and replace electrolytes when you're having issues with diarrhea. And as we talked about, because serotonin production can be um, shunting away the production of niacin, some patients may need niacin supplements. It's important to work with a dietitian. And if you have a history of surgical resections or are having carcinoid syndrome symptoms, especially if there's weight loss, then that's the time when we start to consider things like multivitamins, niacin, and dietary modifications. Somatostatin analogs can lead to pancreatic dysfunction and steatorrhea, as we already talked about. And so in those patients, we think about pancreatic enzyme supplementation, as well as potentially supplementing fat-soluble vitamins that may be low due to fat malabsorption. So a few words about amines and foods. These are usually present in aged, fermented, or spoiled protein products. And these can trigger carcinoid tumors to secrete other things that cause symptoms. Examples of amines are things like tyramine, dopamine, serotonin, and histamine. And reactions of these things include increases in blood pressure, headache, uh, skipping or racing heart, flushing, even passing out. So this box shows a couple of 
high amine rich foods, things like aged cheeses, alcohol, smoked, salted, or pickled meats, as well as you see uh, some foods that are moderately high in amines like caffeine containing drinks, coffee, soda, chocolates. There's more about this on a very popular website that talks about these nutritional concerns for carcinoid patients with a link noted below. I've included here some references if you want to see where I got some of this information. And thanks for your time and letting me uh, talk about this topic. Mm. All right, thank you everyone um, for being part of our uh, last session for the day. This is the Q&A. Um, thank you to um, all the panelists that are here today and to all those that uh, could not make it for really great lectures. This was really a fantastic day. So thank you to all of you. So today um, with us, we have Dr. David Richards from um, MD Anderson Cancer Center, Dr. Jennifer Chan from uh, Dana-Farber, uh, Dr. Oz um, Ahmed from the University of Chicago, Dr. Uh, Lon Heath from UCSF, and then our own uh, Dr. Setia and Dr. Liao, uh, also from the University of Chicago. So um, we've gotten a lot of questions uh, through Slido. As a matter of fact, we gotten, uh, we've gotten over 60 questions, and we're going to spend a little bit of time here the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, going through some of these questions that you've asked. So uh, thanks again for being uh, part of our panel and uh, thanks to all our patients who have followed um, the NetRF conference throughout the day today. So let's start uh, with the first question. Um, I've put them in four uh, categories, nuclear medicine, IR surgery, I've grouped that together, uh, octreotide and sort of more general questions. So uh, there's a a uh, patient here that says that uh, his or her serotonin levels are remaining high in the 600s, even though her primary tumor and the uh, liver metastasis have been removed. And the question to the panel is if this is um, unusual. So um, I think I'll, I'm going to uh, call out to uh, uh, Jennifer Chan here and then to Dave uh, Richards as well to see if there are any nutritional things that can cause high serotonin levels. So why don't we start with uh, Jen? What do you think? Do you do you see this uh, in patients where the serotonin level remains high, or how reliable is serotonin as a marker? That's another question, I guess, in this case. Yeah, I think we have to be careful with the markers. Um, some of the markers haven't really been so well validated for follow-up after resection. I typically don't follow markers like serotonin or chromogranin routinely after surgery. Um, they can, for instance, be elevated for other reasons, whether it be medication or diet. So I would really just uh, make sure there's good imaging follow-up and good attention to symptoms rather than relying on blood tests themselves. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Richards, anything to add to that? Well, I, I think, you know, with symptomatic patients, there's, uh, there's been some buzz about avoiding high amine containing foods and how these may, you know, contribute to uh, tumor product production um, and uh, contribute to symptoms. Um, so, but I, I would have to defer maybe to Dr. Chan or, or some of the other experts here to say whether or not you'd see increased like serum levels of these things if you were on a particularly high amine you know food diet i don't i don't know how much that's really going to fuel things and then wind up like kicking up your your tumor markers but there there has been buzz of, you know nutritionally about vo avoiding high amine foods um in patients who are pretty symptomatic with carcinoid syndrome yeah, I think you bring up a very good point. I think that we all would agree that um, uh, metastatic nets, even after surgery, are rarely cured, right? So there's some disease left behind somewhere. And even though, like Dr. Chan suggested, uh, you know, if we have really good uh, scans, for example, like a PET scan, you know, it could certainly, uh, it doesn't necessarily rule out that there's microscopic disease somewhere. And you have to think of these cells like little factories, right? They keep producing some of these hormones. And sometimes I guess even uh, nutrition or stress or like medication can essentially affect the production um, of the hormones. So I think it's a really good point that you bring up to maybe try a low amine diet and see if that actually makes a difference. Um, I don't know, uh, Jen or like Andy, if you have any experience with this, but uh, certainly something to try. Um, okay, so let's move on to uh, the next question. So this is gonna be a question for uh, Courtney. So. Um, 
Can you please discuss your experience with the relatively new copper scan for nets and how helpful is it if you compare it to the gallium uh, scan for nets? Absolutely. And um, so I, th I think what's being referred to here is the copper 64 dotatate PET scan, as opposed to what kind of the FDA, the previously FDA approved agent that came before that was gallium 68 dotatate PET scan. Um, so the key thing to keep in mind is that the compound itself, the only thing that's changed between the two compounds is the radioactive atom. Uh, that, that lets us take the picture of it with a PET scan. So the compound itself, dotatate, is exactly the same. And, and so it's a, actually a pretty small difference. Now, the um, copper 64 came about, uh, you know, after gallium 68 on the basis of, there were a couple of papers that showed, you know, that it was similar to maybe slightly increased in our ability to find um, lesions. Now, um, I got to be honest, when we first switched over at, at our facility at UCSF and started using this, there were some growing pains because it, it, it images a little bit differently. And this is all just stuff on the back end that wouldn't really affect, um, it wouldn't really affect a patient downstream, but we found, we thought that they were pretty sort of, um, difficult to look at scans compared to gallium 68. It actually required us to make the PET scans a little bit longer in order to get enough um, signal. Uh, but that's all sort of shop talk. And honestly, um, there's been a lot of talk back and forth. Is this better? Is it worse? Is it, you know, whatever? I think our, ultimately our experience, we do a ton of these um, now. We've switched over completely to gallium 64. Um, and in, in our experience, it's not better. It's not worse. It's just, it's just a little different. And ultimately, um, I think either one, you know, if, if your insurance, you know, often these days people are getting one or the other because their insurance covers one or the other. And ultimately that it's really not a deal breaker either way. Um, so I wouldn't worry either way. The one thing I would say is you, the, the one sort of caution I would say is you can't compare SUVs or anything between a copper and a gallium. So whichever one you end up getting, it's best to get the same one every time. If you're all, if you get a copper scan, you don't want to get a copper scan and then a gallium and then a copper and a gallium. That's harder to compare. Uh, so keeping it all copper, 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 or gallium, gallium, gallium. Perfect. Thank you so much. So the next question would be a question uh, that I think uh, we all could answer, but I also would like to hear Dr. Sertia's point on that. Uh, how do you determine which tumor is the primary tumor? And I think that refers to uh, patients that perhaps present uh, with a dotatip scan or some other form of scan that showed multiple uh, sites of disease uh, without any convincing um, evidence that there is actually a large primary tumor somewhere. So how would we address this, let's say, from a pathological perspective? Um, we'll certainly come back to some of the imaging clues that we could certainly have to, to determine where the primary tumor is. But let's say we take a biopsy of the liver and we know that these tumors don't uh, traditionally originate in the liver. Dr. Setia, is there something from that biopsy specimen that you could do to help us determine where these tumors came from? Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Kruyen. This That's a very good question. And I think it's very important, uh, not just for the patients, but for also for us, because several times we are able to answer that and we feel great about it, but then other times we are not able to answer it and then we feel very bad about ourselves. <laughs> so as I mentioned that we are able to answer it several times and that's using certain markers uh, which are expressed by the, the neuroendocrine tumor cells, and they need certain transcription factors for them to grow. And based on what transcription factors they are using to grow, uh, which we can see under the microscope by staining them differentially, we are able to tell. For example, if the tumor is very strongly staining for, say, CDX2, that's one of the markers, which we can, which is easily available in most labs, we are able to say it's coming from small intestine. But then there are other times when they are not expressing CDX2 and they are not expressing some other transcription factors which are very strongly indicated. Then we, are, we, we really rely on imaging to see where the bulk of the tumor is located and to determine what the primary site is. So I would say that in about 80% cases, we are able to tell what the primary site is. But in the other um, instances, uh, we use 
imaging is one uh, modality that we would use. The other is molecular techniques. And sometimes when we do molecular, we are able to find certain mutations or certain copy number changes that we are able to say, well, it could be coming from pancreas. So we try to use as many ancillary techniques as are available to us. Again, sometimes we are unsuccessful. Thank you. And I would add that from a radiologic perspective, two radiologists here, one nuclear medicine, one IR perspective. But I think even as a surgeon, if you look very carefully at the scans, you can often uh, see or try to figure out what the primary is. So uh, small bowel neuro endocrine tumors, for example, are notorious for being very small and very hard to detect on um, any form of a scan. But if you look carefully, um, usually if you see lymphadenopathy, so um, enlarged lymph loads around the mesenteric vessels, so the vessels that supply the small bowel, it will be very unusual to be another site of disease except for the small bowel. You can have retroperitoneal nodes uh, that can certainly come from the pancreas or the lung. Um, but usually if there is a disease within the small bowel mesentery, it's almost certain that it's either going to be a colonic or a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor. So there are certain hints on the radiology report where we could certainly get some information from, um, I would say. Dr. Chen, does it matter whether you know where the primary tumor is? I mean, if you have metastatic disease, I guess that's a million dollar question. Should we ask Dr. Setia to do a thousand stainings and really work hard? And then she feels bad because she can't tell us, you know, where it's coming from. I mean, does it really matter in your management? Or is it okay to just say a tumor is unknown primary? I do think it is um, helpful to know where it started. And I think we also will ask our pathologist to give their, their best guess of where it started because it, it can help prognostically. Um, there are some differences stage for stage, grade for grade between small bowel neuroendocrine tumors and pancreas and lung neuroendocrine tumors. And I think also importantly, there are some differences in responsiveness to therapy, most notably, for instance, lung and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors being more chemotherapy responsive. So that's why I think why we try as best we can to determine primary site. That's why we still need Dr. Setia. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, good. Next question is going to be for uh, Dr. Ahmed, who's uh, ready to answer it, I hope. So um, there's a patient that said that at the NET conference last November, a targeted treatment was reported to be in clinical trial using ultrasound beams. What have been the findings so far? Can you summarize that? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm ready for your question as always, um, Xavier. Um, so I think the question is referring to a new technology known as histotripsy, which is um, basically using ultrasound waves um, have a, uh, used, used to be sort of a side effect of ultrasound is that it could create cavitation, but they've sort of harnessed that energy and focus those beams to actually blast tumors away. Um, it's really attractive because it's non-invasive and it's also non-thermal, meaning it doesn't um, require heat. It doesn't uh, heat up the tissues, which um, could potentially have negative consequences to um, close critical structures. So that um, first, um, the first study that was completed uh, was actually done in Europe. That went um, uh, very well. They showed good results. They were really mainly looking for safety to make sure that this is to be safely used in humans and also um, get good responses. Um, and then the, uh, the first study in the United States, as mentioned, sort of started last year. It is actually still ongoing. Um, they did uh, sort of um, just uh, complete enrollment uh, the tar for, for submitting the information to the FDA or the government to get approval here in the United States. So um, I don't unfortunately have um, any conclusive data yet because we're waiting um, for the um, study results to accumulate. But uh, we're really optimistic that this technology will be approved um, within the year or two. Great. Thank you. Dr. Liao, I know we can't see you, but um, hopefully we can hear you. One of the questions regarding octreotide, since you gave that lecture, was other than the administration process, is there any real difference between lanuotide and long-acting octreotide or sandostatin? <clears throat> there definitely are differences in terms of um, you know, biodistribution and pharmacokinetics. In, in other words, you know, after the drug is administered, how it hangs out in your body, how it's eliminated. Other than the administration, um, you know, one is uh, subcutaneous and one is intramuscular. Efficacy-wise, you wouldn't say, you know, definitively that one is better than another in terms of um, tumor control or in terms of um, symptom control. Great, thank you. 
Back to Dr. Lon Heath. So there's a patient here that uh, said that she or he had a good effect after four cycles of PRT. So the question is, why can't you follow up at lower doses, quote unquote, uh, using a maintenance therapy? Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question. It's something that people um, have looked at and are looking at um, in some locations, uh, in particular in Canada. There are some centers that are doing maintenance uh, doses of PRRT. Um, generally, the I think the reason that that's not being looked at much here um, and by most centers is it's generally thought that you know it it has its therapeutic effect. And then why would you give these constant sort of sub therapeutic, you know, these small doses that are less likely there, there are some concerns that if you keep giving really small doses um, of PRRT, that you're actually sort of encouraging, you're not giving enough to actually kill the tumor cells and you're sort of encouraging them to become resistant um, to PRRT. Now, again, that's something that's been sort of shown like in vitro in other tumors, it's very unclear if this act, if how much this really applies to PRRT in net, which is why there are people, um, particularly in Canada that are, that are looking at this. Um, but I think for now, what we're, what we generally think is like, let's go ahead and hit those tumors hard a few times with a dose we know is going to be therapeutic. Uh, and, and then, uh, when the time comes later down the road, um, if necessary, if there was a good response after those first four cycles, then maybe in a, in a few years when progression happens again and the time is right, we could actually just retreat with a whole nother course of PRRT instead of just hitting it with all these sub-therapeutic doses, if that makes sense. It does to me. <laughs> so um, and another question for Dr. Chen and maybe Dr. Richards, I don't know, but um, I have carcinoid syndrome. What should my dentist know regarding um, anesthesia? Is there anything in particular, Dr. Chan, that the dentist should know about? We all go to the dentist, or I hope so. Yeah, it's always helpful, I think, when my patients ask this to understand what sort of procedures are, are being planned. I think if it's just a routine dental cleaning, that's not going to involve any anesthesia. It's you know, something we don't necessarily have to worry about. I think if there's any anesthesia involved, it's helpful to know what kind of anesthesia is planned. Um, you know, I think we have historically tried to avoid like catecholamine type anesthesia, like epinephrine, because of the potential that it might worsen carcinoid syndrome or, or potentially provoke a crisis. I think the likelihood of that happening is quite honestly, relatively low, especially because of the kind of local anesthesia that most dentists give. Um, but I would also just, you know, when we try to time these procedures, make sure that the octreotide or lanreotide has been given so that the syndrome control is as best as possible. There is a follow-up question for Dr. Richards. There was a question where one of the patients asked whether um, altogether they should avoid um, alcohol um, if you're a net patient, what would you say to those patients? So there are definitely like a list of trigger foods um, that will precipitate symptoms. So typical ones that you read in the literature, things like tomato dishes, chocolate, nuts, raw veggies, pineapple, milk, bananas, but alcohol um, has been implicated as well, in particular uh, in regards to flushing. Um, so I probably like a lot of, um, uh, conditions, this is, this is probably one of those personal experience things, but I think if a patient's having flushing or if they're noticing symptom increase or symptom burden after drinking alcohol, it might be time to cut it out. Um, I would say in general, there's a lot of buzz right now in the oncology world about any alcohol, um, maybe not being a good idea in terms of your cancer risk. You know, it's a little bit debatable as you get older and issues with cardiac and all that kind of stuff. But, but for oncologists, it seems like everybody's encouraging no alcohol. And then as a gastroenterologist, I spend a lot of my day encouraging people to at least moderate alcohol. So, but specifically for NETs, maybe contributing to some flushing symptoms. Would it matter? Are you aware of any uh, type that is worse? So is red wine worse than white wine or beer, for example, or it does make a difference? I uh, haven't heard a difference. Um, I guess beer is a little bit of a, com a complex beverage. There's a lot of protein there and some other things. Um, you know, I guess if you're mixing drinks and you're mixing it with things that have caffeine and, and that sort of stuff, you may be adding other precipitants right. uh, of symptoms. So, so that might not be all that helpful. Um, 
but uh, but uh, probably a little bit of trial and error. But if you're looking, if you're saying to yourself, hey, I'm still having symptoms and I'm wondering why, and alcohol might be uh, on the top of the list of things to cut out to see what helps reduce symptoms. Great, thank you. Dr. Ahmed, um, so this is a you versus me question. Um, how do you consider liver debulking versus interventional radiology? So that's a clash of the titans here. <laughs> Well, you know, like any good interventional radiologist, I just listen to whatever you say. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just uh, listen to whatever the oncologists say. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> it's one big circle. Um, no, I mean, uh, it's actually a really good question. I think, um, I think it's a nuanced answer in the sense that, it, you know, um, we routinely have this discussion, you know, every tumor board, we, we look at the patient's imaging and um, I do, you know, in all honesty, we do defer to your expertise in terms of the surgical ability to remove the tumors. Really the short and dirty answer is if there's a lot of tumors that, that you know, you would have to spend hours and hours or potentially not even be able to take all of them out, um, then we tend to sort of favor the bland embolization um, approach. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think in general, we, we prefer if we can try to re surgically remove them and, but if it's not feasible, then we sort of prefer the interventional approach. Yeah, I completely agree. And I would even add that, uh, one is not exclusive or the other. The only time that I get a little bit, um, let's say, uh, discouraged to bring somebody to the operating room is somebody has had Y90, which, uh, sometimes can really cause fibrosis of the healthy liver, and that makes the operation a lot harder. Tumors tend to stick a lot. You know, we can't take out quite as much liver because we know we're beating up the liver a lot more. But uh, but as you know, you and I have done it many times that patients had blood embo and then go for surgical debulking or have surgical debulking recur only in the liver and then have bland embo. I think that's, that's, that's very reasonable. And I think one is not exclusive for the other. So again, I think it depends um, also where you are at, uh, as a patient in like what center. Um, all right, so uh, let's keep on moving. We got a few more minutes here. So um, that's an interesting one. I was curious to see what Dr. Chan and uh, what Courtney have to say here. So being told PRT, not an option because the mesenteric mass is surrounding the artery. And so I'm assuming it's at the root of the mesentery or something like that. And they say PRT would cause swelling, including the artery. So here, and Dr. Liao, please chime in as well. We talk about, uh, probably what some people refer to as pseudo progression. So, um, is PRT really contraindicated in patients with mesenteric masses? So we routinely do PRT uh, in patients with mesenteric masses, although we don't do it in every single patient with a mesenteric mass. So it sort of depends on the size of the mass and it's sort of a number of other factors. Um, I will say uh, in general, so what we do with all these patients though is we uh, co we administer steroids along with, and we do a steroid taper um, in, in the cases of like bigger masses in order to make sure uh, that we minimize the chances of that mass swelling after getting PRRT. Dr. Chen, any comments on that? Do you give steroids to your patients as well? Yeah, I was gonna say, we've taken a similar approach. I think we've had similar concerns that you might you know, provoke bowel obstruction for patients who have like a lot of peritoneal disease or a lot of mesenteric disease. Um, and I think a lot of the data are actually, it's mostly anecdotal um, about how helpful steroids may or may not be. But I think we've, we've tried to avoid some of the at least acute complications of the PRT in patients who have a lot of mesenteric or peritoneal disease. Dr. Liao, you want to chime in about sometimes even sending them to surgery prior to PRT? Is that something that yeah, we do? Yeah, I agree. You know, um, these bowel obstructions um, after PRT is something we definitely see from time to time, especially uh, with people with a lot of um, peritoneal mesenteric disease. And sometimes if we can have the disease, you know, surgically resected to make them more optimal candidates, something, sometimes that's what we do first before um, considering PRT, but definitely echoing um, Courtney and, and Jennifer, you know, we also consider steroids for these patients as well. Yeah, and I would add that from a surgical perspective, we can't uh, do miracles, but uh, occasionally, so if it's root of the mesentery lymphadenopathy, there's nothing we can do about it surgically, but I would argue that, you know, if there's, let's say, a five centimeter grade one or grade two lymphadenopathy that you know where some bowel feel like 
looks like it's stuck to it and you know it's going to cause some issue, definitely it's it, it's a possibility to go in prior to given PRT and, uh, and, and, you know, potentially resecting it. But obviously, you got to make sure the tumor is not rapidly progressing or anything like that because it would uh, just set the patients back by the time they recover. Um, that's great. So um, that's an interesting question too. Are some atostatin um, analogs recommended for single liver metastases from a small intestine primary or would PRT be used? So here we can all chime in because I think this goes across all our specialties. So Oz would tell you he can ablate it probably if it's a single metastasis. <laughs> I would tell you I could take it out and or ablate it. Uh, Dr. Chan would probably tell you that uh, before, I don't know, what, what would you say before you put somebody on PRT, Dr. Chen, before I speak for you? Yeah, no, I would actually say that if it's a solitary lesion, I would favor doing something, whether it be surgery or um, ablation, because that I think hopefully we could, if that is controlled, you know, not even necessarily need to start any systemic therapy. I, I would just jump in here real quick as the nuke med um, person and, and just say, you know, PRT is one of those, those things that, you know, as we know, there is radiation associated with it. And as such, you can only get it, you know, so many times in your life. And so we want to save it for the time that it's going to be, you know, we only have, we have a lot of tools in our tool belt, but it's still, it's a finite number, right? So we want to save PRT for the time we know it's going to have the most impact. And, you know, just having a single met, uh, there are very few cases in which uh, I would say that's the right time for PRT. Thank you, Courtney. Um, also an interesting one that I think affects probably about one out of five patients with metastatic disease. So, but uh, Andy, what's the best way to treat metastasis in the bone? Um, and what's your opinion on uh, biphosphonates? So that's a good question. So, um, you know, we know neuroendocrine tumors can metastasize to the bones and um, sometimes it can cause complications like pain or fractures and things like that. Um, in general, you know, when we have um, patients on some kind of systemic therapy, whether it be somatostatin analog or PRT, theoretically, you're treating the whole body, so including those bone metastases. Now, in, um, you know, other cancers, you know, with bone metastases, we frequently use things like um, like uh, solentronic acid, you know, bisphosphonates or, or things like the nosumab to prevent what's called uh, skeletal related adverse events, which are, you know, fractures and pain and, and these bad things that can happen with having cancer in the bone. And, you know, depending on the burden of disease in the bone, that is sometimes uh, something we consider for that patient as well. Thank you, Andy. Anything to add, uh, Jennifer? No, I, I agree. Um, I think we try to best control the disease with whatever systemic modality you choose, but then pay a special attention to reducing the risk of a, a skeletal event. I think the follow-up of patients with bone metastases can be very tricky. And I think that's where following with some form of PET imaging, whether it be copper 64 or gallium 68 is really, I think, quite critical. Um, so it may be that you don't need it all the time, but I think you have to um, pay attention. And I think sometimes you don't see everything well in the bone on, on CT. So that's where we can get bit fooled. I think that's a very good point. And then Oz, if you have a a single area that let's say you have multiple bone met, but one area where that, that's really hurtful, uh, where patients are truly symptomatic. Is there anything on on your end, either from a radiology or radon or IR perspective, that you can do to help there? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I was going to chime in too that you know there is a role usually for IR or, or radiation oncology for for bone meds, and uh, you you specifically highlighted for patients who have um, you know pain, and that's usually you know you can have pain. Uh, related to bone meds for two reasons. One is the tumor itself can cause pain. And then the second, as Andy mentioned, is it can actually, the bone can actually fracture because the tumor sort of eats away at the bone. So um, speaking from just an IR perspective, um, there are, are treatments that we can do to treat both. Um, so one we do is uh, we actually, we can do ablation for, for bone meds. So we can put needles into the bone and, and burn the tumor away. And then, um, and then secondly, we can fix the fracture by essentially inflating bo uh, balloons to kind of restore the height of the bone and then fill the cavity with um, uh, cement. Uh, most, most of these fractures occur in the spine. So this is called, you know, spinal ablation uh, with uh, what we call kyphoplasty. Thank you, Oz. We're almost out of time, but let's do one more just because we have, we're having so much fun here. So let's see this one. 
Are there um, any new therapies for neuroendocrine tumor patients that lack somatostatin receptors? I think, Jen, you gave us a great talk about all the potential things that are on the way here and the clinical trials that are going on. But is there anything on your end that you can think of to answer a question? It's a little bit of a general question, but. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there is um, a lot of work that's being done to look at targeted therapies. Um, for instance, cabozantinib is a, uh, an agent, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's being investigated. But, you know, essentially all of the systemic therapies that we currently use, whether it be everolimus or chemotherapy are things that we would, you know, use instead of a somatostatin analog or a PRT and, you know, any trial that doesn't require presence of somatostatin receptors potentially um, could be considered in, in a patient whose disease is not, not somatostatin receptor expressing. And that uh, certainly comes also uh, to a point that uh, most of us are also doing research and obviously trying to figure out how we can, uh, you know, improve the treatments of uh, those tumors that do have somatostatin receptors, but also of those that don't, uh, obviously. So, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, an amazing day. I think uh, uh, you really Eve gave, uh, each gave a fantastic lecture. I've followed all of you. I think uh, I think it's, it was really phenomenal. I hope that our patients um, enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, thank you, obviously, to the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation for um, organizing this. This, I think, is the fifth year that I'm co-chairing this. So uh, it's it's been really a pleasure to work with uh, NetRF and it's been a pleasure to work with all of you. So I hope to see you back next year um, and hopefully I'll see you before that though. So thank you so much to all of you. Have a great weekend. And I think uh, we will switch over if you want to go back to the NetRF website for some final uh, comments and uh, I'll see you next year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koitkin. You've been a terrific co-chair again this year, and we're so honored to work with you and your colleagues. Thank you to all of our speakers for sharing your time and expertise with us today. We want to thank our sponsors, our co-sponsor, University of Chicago Medicine, as well as Advanced Accelerator Applications, Ipsen, Tercera, Progenix, ITM, Crinetics, and Hutchmed. This program would not be possible without the team behind the scenes. We salute Rich Tamayo, our video producer, for an amazing job this year. My NetRF team, Christine Coffey and Jennifer Long, have worked for months to bring this program to life, and we couldn't have done it without you. Thanks to Josh Mailman for his help with Slido and to NetRF's web team at Portland Digital. So we all hope that today helped you know your nets so you can live your best life. We're so pleased that you decided to spend your day with us, and we hope it was a good and productive day. For now, take care and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Mm -hmm.